Adam, you came here in 2006? Yeah, I came to Los Angeles in 2006, yes. Um, From my Hawaii? first day actually in town, I got hired at DreamWorks in post production. Um, my brother got me a job there. So, like, day one, I like walked up to Universal. I was looking for DreamWorks, and, and then, like, I went over to the right gate finally, and uh, they let me in. I met the head of post production at DreamWorks, Mark, Mark Graziano at the time. And I told them, you know, I want to make a filmmaker and all this kind of stuff. And they needed help at the time. And he was like, you know what? You want to work here for a while? We need a little extra help. And I was like, it was like a 20 minute conversation. And then he hired me and I worked there for a couple months um, on Disturbia, uh, which was shooting at the time. And then Indiana Jones is in pre-production. And then they also had, um, what is it called? It's a movie with Ben Stiller. It's a Co not a Coen Brothers, or the Farley Brothers. Yeah, it was a Farley Brothers movie. Um, and they did that movie too, but anyway, I was running dailies and doing all kinds of stuff like day one, and so it was kind of crazy. Um, I had to start in like a 1989 Ford Taurus, uh, running dailies around uh, town. Like I had the 35 millimeter um, projected um, film in my car um, for Eddie Murphy's um, Raw. And so it was like day one and I'm delivering this raw footage, you know, the 35 millimeter. I'm like, God, they trust me already to like deliver this footage. Like if this got lost, you know, they would never have that 35 millimeter again. So that was, it was very interesting. That was day one for me. And so I worked there for a while. And then from there, I ended up working for Todd Phillips, who did Hangover, Road Trip, Starsky and Hodge, all those movies. And I, I worked in the front office for them doing mostly script coverage. So, like I did notes on Hangover before Hangover ever came out. And um, yeah, I was, I was like heavily uh, pushing to cut one of the scenes in the movie. They ended up cutting it later. Um, I don't know if it was because of me or not, but uh, I was, uh, I love the script. Like they really wanted to do a different movie at the time. And I was just like, what about Hangover, Hangover? Every day I was, I was so stoked about Hangover because it was such an original script at the time. It was kind of like a murder mystery comedy, you know? And I, at the time, no one had ever done it. And obviously the movie was huge. So um, a lot of people liked it, so. So you'd been in town one day? And yes, that was my home. first day uh, in town. And my brother got me a meeting with Mark Graziano, the head of post production. And uh, it was just supposed to be a general meeting. And so I met him and talked with him and we talked for 20, 30 minutes and um, he knew that I was new to town and he was just a really nice guy and he was like, we need help around here. Do you want to work here? It was my birthday too, actually. So I know it was October 18th, 2006. So I know exactly what day it was. So, yeah. And so, you, sorry, you'd come from Hawaii or you'd come from Pennsylvania? I came from Hawaii. I went to a college in HBU, Hawaii Pacific University. And... Um, yeah, I, I came here to try to make it in show business, so. So you've been in, you'd been in LA 24 hours. What was it like? Because I hear Hawaii, everybody's very relaxed and it's just a totally different culture. Then how, how was that? It's very different, but when you first get here, it's just so much excitement, you know? Like, um, I think when you first get to, to Hollywood and to Los Angeles, you're like, there's just this energy that like your dreams could come true at like any, turn of a corner you know you can meet somebody that could give you a film as an actor or as a director or everyone around you is is so important to you you know you don't know who you're talking to half the time and um so there's just a, an excitement to it and later on i mean i still love the city but it's it's very much a different feeling in a way of um now that i've made my my first feature while he got wasted uh it's very much like i have a different point of view of not so much like who are you and what can you you know, are you somebody who can make my dreams come true? I, I kind of have the feeling of like, you have to do it yourself. Like you have to make it yourself and just make it happen. So it's, it's very different in that way. And aside from your brother putting in a good word for you, what do you think helped sort of seal the deal? Because that helps, but then that doesn't know, I guess people in the door doesn't always get the people a job or able to keep the job. What do you think? I think, you know, I see, it's funny because a lot of people come here with a lot of confidence, come to Los Angeles and come to Hollywood with tons of confidence. And slowly and slowly I see that beaten out of a lot of people. You know, they get become people's assistants or they, whatever they do, they get beaten down like you're not so special, you're not good, whatever. 
but I, I've always just had undeniable confidence. And I think when you talk to people and you have such confidence, maybe they scratch their head and go, maybe you're right or, you know, but you got to have that confidence in yourself and, and, and the fact that you won't give up or, like, and I've, I've always had that. I've always had like, you say, I can't, this can't be done. Watch me do it. I'm going to do it anyway. So, uh, and that's, that's been true with my whole career, really. I mean, while I got wasted, there was people that told me with the film, they said, listen, we shot while I got wasted for 70 grand, by the way. It looks so amazing. It, it looks like wow. a studio movie. We shot it for 70 grand. And there was people that, you know, first, I remember our first AD told me, he said, listen, the script's great, but you can't do this, okay? You're, you're way over your head. You don't have enough money. You have 38 locations you want to shoot in 22 days. You can't do this. And I just said, well, you're not the right guy for the job. You know, <laughs> I'm doing this. This is going to get done. And, and we did do it. We, we shot 38 locations in 22 days. And it was very hard, but we did it. And I never gave up. And even though some people around me wanted to give up at times, we, we did not give up. And we got it done. Why do you think he told you that? Because I don't think that was possible in his brain to, to do that. I, I don't think. And so many people um, want to make films, you know, but then when you get in the thick of making a film, it's very hard. I mean, I was sleeping two hours, maybe three hours a day for a whole month straight. You're, you're basically kind of killing yourself, you know, and I was acting in the film. So, you know, the makeup artist is like, I can't make you look like you looked on day one because you're killing yourself and it's showing up on camera. You know, the makeup can only do so much. So it's, yeah, you can't have give up in your head. It cannot happen at all. It, it can't be a possibility or you will give up in this town. Like people that come here and say that I'm going to give it a year uh, in my acting career, you know, or whatever. I'm going to give it a year and see where I'm at. No, if you have a backup plan, you're going to fail. There's no backup plan. Like there's no possibility of everything else. You need to constantly be moving forward and thinking about how I'm going to achieve this goal. And, and that's all that, that or you'll fail or you'll give up. So, you know, if it takes 30 years, I have no backup plan. That's all that there is. So that's, that's kind of the personality you got to have and the mentality you have to have. So. What keeps you here now? In Los Angeles? Good question. Um, I love the city and I've been lucky enough that I came here, my brother lived here, but now pretty much my whole family has moved here. So now I have family here, so it's a little different. My sister's here, my younger sister, and my parents are in Palm Desert, so it's not far. So family, in a way, would keep me here no matter what. But I love Los Angeles. Um, it's such a sprawled out city. There's all these different pockets um, of cool things to do or hikes or whatever. So, and the weather's beautiful. So, you know, I don't try to promote it. <laughs> I never, I never try to get more people to move here because so many people move here already. So. But a lot of people move back. Back home. Yeah. A lot of people give up too and move away, but because of the weather, I feel like a lot of people move to Los Angeles in general. Sure. Um, but no, I, I, I'm in the Mecca of movie making in the United States. I mean, that's where Los Angeles is. So I don't know what kind of trials and tribulations you'd have if you were in Atlanta or somewhere else. Maybe there, there's enough people that I wouldn't, you know, you have enough film people. But here, I mean, in my phone, I have 10 DPs I can call, directors of photography, I can call and they own a camera. You know what I mean? So it's like, here, there's so many people that are making films. There's so many people that own cameras. It's really saturated. So to get a project off the ground, off the ground, it's a lot easier to get it off the ground. As to where in middle of America, do you know anyone that owns a red camera or Ari Alexa or any of these kind of cameras? It's probably really hard to find somebody that own one, owns one in like Nebraska or something. So here, you're in a bar, you're probably somebody in the bar probably owns a camera. I mean, it's just so, it's so saturated in that way, so. Well, hopefully they're sober enough to operate it, but yeah. Well, <laughs> they're not going on set okay, like okay, that, good, but when good. you meet them, you right, never right, know. Right. So. Okay. But do you have a, a goal list? Like, do you have a certain amount of things that you know by this date I want to have them completed? I mean, I want to make 30 movies in my life, probably. Um, it's whatever inspires me, really. I mean, I have, in my phone, I have ideas for movies that go on and on. I mean, I must have 20 or 30 ideas for features. Um, some are fleshed out and some are really raw, just uh, one or two sentences. But I also have uh, a TV show, like I did 
So I came here and I worked for DreamWorks and I worked for Todd Phillips and then I realized it's funny because I realized the people around me had want to be directors or they want to be some position in film and they weren't doing it yet. And I was like, how long have you worked here? And Oh, I've been doing this 11 years, but I want to be a film director. And I was like, so I could be you in 11 years? I was like, yeah, I got to stop. So when I left Todd Phillips' office. I was like, I want to act and direct. So I went to acting school and I started acting in... Um, every possible thing I could. I did 11 short films in 2009, and then I was a lead in three um, independent feature films in 2010. And when I saw the independent feature films, I realized they weren't good enough, and I thought to myself, I have to get behind the camera if I really want to make my dreams come true. And I always planned on getting behind the camera anyway, eventually, but it just kind of pushed me to do it sooner. So I thought I was just going to produce an act. And so I put... I managed to raise the money together to shoot a TV pilot um, and I was going to produce. We had a director and everybody. The director pulled out and it was his script. So I told the money people, hold on, I'll write something else uh, and we can shoot that. So I ended up writing Three Guys in a Couch, uh, which is a TV pilot that I wrote and, and ended up directing because I couldn't find a director. Everybody couldn't see the vision that I had, so I ended up directing it too. So I acted and directed and wrote it. And we shot it in 2011. It's actually on Amazon Prime. You can go watch it on Amazon Prime. And uh, it's for free on there. And it's a 20 minute pilot. It's a comedy pilot. I kind of, I loved Seinfeld growing up. And so it was kind of my newer version of Seinfeld, you know, um, my best version of it, I guess, that I could do. And it's just about three guys trying to rent out their couch for, to make rent. So, I mean, the whole episode is couch interviews. They're interviewing people to rent the couch. So that was the pilot episode. And I have, oh God, I have in my phone like 50 episodes of that show. I just kept writing ideas for that show and that show and show. So hopefully I do another show and, and use all those ideas eventually. But I did that TV pilot. It was the first thing I ever directed. Um, and then I ended up from that pilot, um, someone at Fox saw it and Fox called me in and was like, hey, it was a subsidiary of Fox, but it's on the Fox lot. Called me and it was like, hey, we'd really like to develop a new show with you. Like, this was really good for your first thing. So let's, let's develop something else. So I came in every week for like eight or nine months, developing new ideas with them for new shows. And um, eventually settling on a show called Parole Officers, which is about a guy who gets arrested and he gets two parole officers um, that are going to help him change his life back around, but he, get, he, he got falsely arrested for drugs, so he really has no problem with drugs. And the two parole officers are completely crazy that, that take over his life and just totally destroy it even more. So we shot that in 2000, well, hold on, rewind. Fox ended up scheduling him for me to do a table read. They were like, we're going to give you a million dollar budget to do the pilot, all this kind of stuff. And then they ended up pulling the plug. And so the day before the table read, they were like, we have something similar, now we're not going to shoot this anymore. Oh, my goodness. Um, what they did not know is I, every time I would come in with a script or an idea, well, not an idea, but a script, I was copywriting it. So I, are, I knew that I owned the copyright on the show. So, okay, you have something similar, but you're not going to steal my idea. So I was like heartbroken for a while. I mean, it's hard to get over. It was eight or nine months, you know, of yeah. me telling my friends and everyone I'm doing a show with Fox, you know what I mean? So for me, it was like, it was very heartbroken when it didn't happen. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to shoot myself. So um, three guys on a couch we shot for five grand at the time on the red cameras. So this, I actually ended up shooting for five grand as well. It's a 27 minute pilot. That's also on Amazon Prime now, uh, parole officers. And so I ended up raising the money independently, and we shot that TV pilot as well in 2013. And then from there, um, there was, I ended up directing two short films for Friends, and then it was like, it's time to do a feature. So that's when Wally Got Wasted got made. So I'm hoping we can go back to when you worked at Todd Phillips' office, and at what point did you have that, like, wow, I could be this person here or this person here, and they seem happy with their job, maybe not, maybe they are, but I don't want to have that be me. How did you, like, what, can you kind of take us through how long before you left after I that? think in the beginning, I think in the beginning it was just so exciting to be there. I mean, like, 
Angelina Jolie would come in the office, you know, like Angelina Jolie was in the hallway and I'm like, oh, there's a pretty girl in the hallway. And then she's standing out there for a while. I'm like, maybe this woman's lost, you know, I'll go out there. She was <laughs> pregnant at the time. This pregnant woman's in the hallway, like maybe she's lost. So I went in the hallway, I'm like, hey, are you okay? Like, are you lost? And of course, once I get in the hallway, I'm like, oh, I'm talking to Angelina Jolie. Oh, that's cool. She's like, no, I'm just waiting. I'm about, gonna go into a, a meeting upstairs and I just wanted a moment by myself. And I was like, okay, no problem. You know, I walked back in the office. She's right on the other side of the glass to me, you know, yeah. and there's no one else around. So of course I'm like, oh, you know, Angelina Jolie's here on the computer, you know, telling the office. <laughs> um, and then like the guy played Hellboy at the time, he was coming in the office like, and I met so many people coming in the office that were making movies and, and actors. And so in the beginning, it was just so exciting to be there. You know, on the post side of things, I never would meet movie stars. Or I mean, I met Steven Spielberg and that, but I wouldn't meet like Angelina Jolie at DreamWorks at post-production. They just don't go there. But there it was just so exciting. I think it took a while for the excitement to wear off because I was doing script coverage on like three scripts a day they would expect three scripts a day for me to read and do coverage on them. And, and I'm a slow reader too, so it wasn't easy for me, but constantly trying to break it down and write a, you know, a one page synopsis of the whole movie and, and green light it or not green light it. Like if you didn't get through me, the people above me never read it. So that's how it would work. So if I don't like your script, the person above me doesn't like the script. It's not I'm never going to read the script, you know? And then on top of that, which is kind of crazy to me in a way because these people have agents, they have managers, they have, but if you don't get through the guy at the front desk, you don't get to uh, Scott Budnick at the time or Todd Phillips or anyone else. So I'm literally like green lighting someone's life or not. But if I send it up the ladder and it's not good, my now I'm not considered a very good script coverage guy. So your own, my own ass is on the line. So it was very interesting at the time. I think it took three months before the excitement of it all, wore, all everything kind of wore off and I started asking more questions, you know. And uh, Todd Phillips' assistant at the time was his assistant for like nine years and I found out he was a film director and I saw some commercials he shot and some other stuff and he was like, yeah, I want to be a film director and I was like, but you've been his assistant for nine years? Like, clearly he's not going to help you make a film, you know. Uh, so he's not going to help me make a film. I got to go make a film out on my own. So that's kind of the epiphany that I had that no one here, if you're not doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, they can't see. Like something I've learned in Hollywood since I've been here, people don't see potential. It's not something that they see. It's either you've done it or you haven't done it. It's very rare that someone can see potential of what you've done. Like uh, there's no excuses. It's like you've either made a phenomenal movie or you've made a mediocre movie and then they think you're going to always make a mediocre movie. So, or I guess in any position that you've done, they, can, they don't see potential like, oh, you had a really good moment here or there or your budget, you didn't have enough money. They don't see the excuses. It's either it's good enough or it's not. So. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because it's just everything goes too fast and there's too much money on the line? They don't have time to like nurture something or... I think it might have been different back in the day. They might have nurtured people more back in the day. I mean, like, all the studios now are, are corporate. I mean, like, Viacom, you know, like, all these big companies own the studios. It's not really owned by an individual anymore. Back in the day, Paramount, was it Paramount, I think, was owned by a guy that would go to all the premieres with a lion. I mean, it was one person's decision and a few people below him. And I think in the, what oh, was it, the 90s or something? I mean, all the studios got bought up by big corporate companies, everything's powered by money. So since everything's powered by money, are you going to take a chance on someone who's already delivered or someone who has potential? I mean, if your ass is on the line, you're going to go with the safe bet. So part of me understands that. But I, I think also it takes a very special person to see potential. You know, I, I don't think everyone can see potential. It's about, it's, a, it's almost a rare skill compared to the talent. Like so, only some people are very, very talented. Some people only have that one gift of seeing talent too. Um, and half the people that I meet that are at the top, still, they don't have that gift. Like they shove 20, $40 million in the advertising on a movie and the movie might bomb. Well, somebody else might have been able to see that it was gonna bomb, but they couldn't see it. But they have the title of you know, the, the head of the studio or whatever. So it's just interesting to see how th certain things happen. And I know people in positions that tell me all kinds of stories where, you know, I'm like, really? I saw the trailer to that. I have no idea what that movie's about. And it's a two minute trailer. Like, 
if I don't know what your movie's about at all and it's a two-minute trailer, it's a really bad sign. <laughs> you know, and you're putting $40 million in advertising. That blows my mind, but um, anyway, so. Can we go back to your script reading days? First off, what qualifies someone as a script reader? Like, how do, you, how do they know you're ready to be doing coverage? It's so funny, nothing, nothing qualified me at all. Um, I got the job and they started shoving scripts in my hand. I had no qualifications for that whatsoever. And that's the truth. I got better as I went. Like, I'm sure my first synopsis was kind of like, what the hell is this? But I'm doing three a day. So eventually I'm getting better and better and better. And that's the thing too, like nothing, nothing qualifies you in this industry. Like if you want to make films, if you want to act, whatever you want to do, there's no qualification. People were like, it's not like every other job. And so, but a lot, at the same time, the problem is the whole world doesn't, it is the same when it comes to experience. That's the difference. It's not the same as a qualification as, oh, I went to Harvard. I'm, oh, of course you're, you're qualified to do this job or not. And it's more about, oh, you've done 15 movies. I've seen you have the, the qualifications in the way that I put a camera on you and you're not going to get nervous. You know what I mean? You're going to deliver and, and all that kind of stuff. It's very different in that way. And really, the people I see succeed um, are the people that never give up and keep keep learning and getting better and better and better and and it's very rare to see that because certain people get to a certain age and they want to have babies they want to do certain things and certain things are pulling them in different directions and you know it's very hard to keep trying to do the same thing if you haven't hit the ideal of what you you know imagine but a lot of people come here and say I'll, I'll give it a year like I said before but it's like, would you, if you wanted to be the CEO of Apple, would you give it a year? Or would, because that's what this is. If you're like the lead in a TV show, you're a CEO of that company now. You're the face of that TV show. Everyone is putting millions of dollars behind you. So you better be good, really good, you know, and have no, work your way up and, and, and you know, be the CEO of that company because that's what you are at that point. So that's, you know, and the same thing with the director in a movie, like if you, they give you 20 or $40 million or a hundred million dollars to make a movie, I mean, the money speaks for itself. You're a CEO of that company. You're completely in charge of making that a good movie or a bad movie at that point. So it takes time to get that good and to get people to believe in you, you know? So you didn't have like sort of the qualifications that you thought you would have had to have been a script reader or you were just surprised that they entrusted you um, it, it was, it was mind-blowing to me because before that point we would, uh, me and my brother were writing scripts back in Oregon when I had no connections whatsoever and we would meet a guy that could get it to somebody else. I was now on the other side of it all, reading the scripts. And I realized when I was writing them they were handing it to the intern that has absolutely no qualifications and might just not like my script. No, you, you, mostly everyone reading a script has no qualifications whatsoever. They read it, and then if they like it because of their opinion, it goes up the ladder with someone else who has more experience, someone else who has more experience, and eventually maybe someone who really can look at a script and dissect the whole thing. But you have to get through all these other layers of people that really don't know what they're doing. So you better, it better be so good that they read it uh, and are just so intrigued by it. But it also can just be you ran into the right people, the right three people that loved your script or loved your idea or whatever. So, no, mostly everyone reading a script has no qualifications in the beginning at a studio. So, the bottom layer people have no qualifications. And so, would you ever stop reading a script or you had to, your job was to read it all the way through? You're doing three scripts a day. So, I mean, if I read and it's just horrible, the first 20 pages, I'm gonna to try to sum up the, the script the best way possible. I'll go read the last 15 pages. And most of the people in the office would tell me that. They say, like, um, somebody in there I remember was like, just read the first 10 and the last 10. Decide if you like it, and then you might read it. But otherwise, that's all that matters. Like, if it's not good there, like, get rid of it, you know? So, yeah, so I ended up doing that sometimes, and I felt bad for people, you know? But if it was bad, it was bad, you know? I mean, that's the thing. Like, when you have a stack next to you that's 20 scripts, am I really going to not everyone's going to get an opportunity. So if your first 20 pages, are, there's no bad. The whole thing has to be amazing. So the first 20 pages are bad, well, then your script's done. It's not going to get to the next level. So, and actually, now that I've made a film, uh, distribution companies tell me, like, 
that first 10 minutes of your movie better be amazing, like, because people will turn it off on these streaming platforms. So you better put a lot of your budget in, in that first 10 minutes, have a chase scene, have a gun scene, have whatever captures them, high drama, you know, something to drag that audience in and capture them, you know, because everybody's attention span is so short nowadays. So, yeah. And then what was coverage like? If, if, if you, even if it was just the first 10 and the last 10, how much, uh, like, what are you filling up on a piece of paper of coverage? What was that like? So I wouldn't actually write on the script. I would just write a one page synopsis and try to br basically make an outline of the script. Um, really, if you did coverage on your own script, you'd be saving people a lot of time, to be honest with you, because Hollywood people want your movie in one sentence. And then if they're intrigued by the one sentence, they'll want to read a paragraph. So if you write one sentence that sums up your movie, great. Then write a paragraph that sums up your movie, great. Then have a one-page synopsis that sums up your movie, better. And then have the script. And if you handed that to somebody, they would love you to death because, and you can master getting each one of those great because otherwise the intern's going to write, write your one-page synopsis when you could have done it yourself in a way, or your one-liner or your one paragraph or whatever. So that's kind of how it is. And so then you got the hangover, it landed on your desk or someone else? They had already it? loved hangover. Oh, I didn't, I didn't green light hangover. They already had hangover. They liked hangover. Um, that was one of the two scripts that they were developing at the time. And they were like, it was that and, a, and another script called Man Witch. And when they were like, these are our two movies that we're going to make, check them out eventually. Um, but at the time, all the excitement was over the Man Witch movie, not over ha the hangover. And uh, that was the next movie they were going to make next, not Hangover. And I was constantly like, and maybe Todd always knew he was going to do Hangover. I don't know. I wasn't really talking to Todd that much. I mean, he came in the office and once in a blue moon, you know. Um, Scott Butnick was his partner at the time. And so I had a lot more interaction with him. And uh, for me, when I read it, it was just, you know, it was very funny. And it was, it was a page turner because it's a murder mystery. They're trying to find their friend. So... It was all solid, it was good. And someone else actually wrote that script and then Todd and his partner rewrote that script. So they didn't actually write the first draft of it. So, um, And they went on, I think, to do some other movies and stuff, but yeah. So then eventually you saw that you could become that guy or that girl and you'd be making a nice living, but you wouldn't be doing exactly what you wanted to do. Did you plan to get out or was it one day where you just threw a bunch of papers up in the air and walked out? What happened? No, no. Um, I mean, I was only at each place for like three months anyway. And both of the places, I mean, both places, it was, it was kind of a short term thing anyway. So it wasn't like I had to go, oh, I'm leaving. It was kind of like, well, you, the time is up that you were supposed to be here anyway. So that was nice in a way. It didn't, I didn't get promoted, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. it's very hard for people to turn down money when you first get here. So a lot of these people, it was like, oh, now I'm at 50,000. Oh, now I got 100,000. Now I got 200,000. I'm making 300,000 a year. I have a wife. How am I supposed to leave this job? You know what I mean? Your money depended on that job. And I'm lucky they didn't offer me a position because I might have tried to embrace it, you know, which a lot of people do embrace their nine to five jobs and give up on their dreams. And, um, I'm lucky that I was raised by my father and, uh, and my mom and my dad always instilled in me, you can do anything you want to do. You just have to go for it and not take no for an answer. So that's, that's kind of my mentality with life. You got to go do it. Did you see that in him? Did he do it? In my dad? My dad actually was a, a musician back in the day and uh, he, uh, he was almost the lead singer of Aerosmith when Aerosmith like, uh, was having drug problems and stuff. And there was a guy named Arthur Mann, basically, that um, put a contract in front of my dad and was like, I want you to perform in every club, bar, stage from here to China. Um, and uh, my dad had, uh, unfortunately, my, my mom was pregnant at the time and he, was, he decided to, and he had a real job. And so he gave it up and he became a, a family man, really. And... Uh, the, the same contract, Arthur Mann gave it to Bon Jovi. So Bon Jovi ended up becoming Bon Jovi, and my dad ended up being a, a dad. And, uh, and shortly after, unfortunately, my dad got in a bad car accident, and so he ended up being a stay-home dad, and my mom worked. And so my house was very reversed, I guess, in the 80s. More people, the mom stayed home, and my dad was the stay-home dad. So um, it was very different in that way. And uh, kind of crazy, though, because... He trained my sister how to sing, and so my sister is Zizi Ward. She's a big-time singer, 
And so, you know, the next generation still made it as a singer. She's signed to Hollywood Records, which is Disney, and uh, she's working on her third album now. So um, it kind of, he passed up his music dream, but she accomplished it. So it, it's kind of nice to see that full circle for him, you know, so. Did you see the Jim Carrey documentary? Which one? I saw one where he um, did The Man on the Moon. Are you talking about that one? Yeah, and he ta I'm pretty sure he talks about his dad. I think his dad was He did accountant. talk about his dad, yeah. I remember his dad, so his dad gave up his dreams to be a comedian in the Jim Carrey documentary. And he did the nine to five, and then the nine to five that was the steady job laid him off. So he realized at that point that there was no safe bet. And that is true, man, it's completely true. I see that all the time with people that they really hold on to their nine to five job, but nothing's guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. So it's like, you gotta take chances. You gotta, you know, that, but that's life. People, you know, you gotta make mistakes too. And that's why a lot of people, I know so many filmmakers that aren't willing to do their first feature because they're too scared to make a mistake. You know, it's like, no, you gotta make it. And if you fail, you fail. Or if you make a movie that's not the best you can do, great, learn from it and make another film. But I know more than one director that is phenomenal that has never done a feature, you know, and I've known them for 10 years, you know. You think it's the money aspect? I could see why that would be scary, but what, what do you think it is? I think people have all kinds of excuses, you know. I mean, I think money is kind of usually the number one excuse. I don't have enough money or I can't get enough money to make the, the feature. But I mean, what are you doing to try to get the money? You know, there's that aspect. A lot of them go, I don't have the right script and I'm not a script writer, you know. Um, a, a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's one of the reasons that while I got wasted, it was like, Seth, my writing partner, Seth Himes, basically, he wrote a script and he came to me and I didn't really particularly like it. I liked the first 20 pages and I was like, the first 20 pages was slightly similar to Wally Got Wasted. And um, I was like, I, th I really thought the movie was gonna go in this direction because in the first three pages, it's about three guys that accidentally kill somebody. And then the movie went a totally different direction. And I was like, I really thought you were gonna kind of reamp Weekend at Bernie's and put Hangover together and kind of do this like new kind of comedy movie because that's, what we ended up doing. And he was like, no. And after he was heartbroken for a while, because I, I told him my honest opinion, he came back and was like, well, let's write the, the idea that you have. Um, and so that was like 2014. And so we were living together at the time, we were roommates, and I laid out the whole movie in one night with him. Um, and I came up with the structure of it. And then he didn't, we didn't end up writing it. He ended up moving out later. And then like six months later, he came back and he wrote a first draft in like a day or two, because he's a very fast writer. And there was like one scene in the first draft, which was the drive through scene in the movie that was phenomenal. And which was great because I could literally, he did my outline though. So it had the correct outline, but it just wasn't as good as it needed to be yet. But it was nice because I always try to stick on the positive because any artist is very sensitive usually. And so I was like, listen, this is phenomenal, but the drive through scene is amazing. And the whole movie needs to be as good as the drive through scene. So we need to do rewrites. So then we, did, then we ended up doing rewrites for about eight or nine months uh, to a year on the script and, um, and getting it to where we thought it was strong. And then we ended up trying to get you know, I had enough connections in Hollywood that I was trying to send it to anybody that could help me make it at the time, which is where mostly every filmmaker ends up dying because they're trying to hand their project to somebody else to help make it. And that's usually falling on dead ears. So we did that and there was one studio that was talking about making it and some other stuff. It was just talk. Um, and eventually I said, you know what, we can't keep doing this. Like, I, I, let's just do it ourselves, you know. Um, so we ended up raising the money ourselves, selling units to the movie uh, for a certain dollar amount. You owned a percentage of the movie. And uh, I was going to sell units to anybody I could sell units to. I sold them to doctors. I sold them to dentists. I sold them to somebody in France. I sold them to somebody in Mississippi. I sold them anywhere I could sell them uh, and talk to people. And, you know, talking to people and convincing them to hand you a check is never easy. But I always tell people I'm one of the luckiest people you ever meet. And uh, people seem to like me and trust me, so I'm, I'm lucky in that aspect. But I deliver. I've, I delivered the movie like I promised I would. Um, so we raised the money. It took like a year, maybe a year and a half to raise uh, the money. Some, not all the money we wanted to, but... Um, 70 grand? Or 
Well, 70 grand, yes. But Seth, my partner, actually was coming up with 40 of that probably. So we only raised like 30 of it. Um, and unfortunately, Seth was in a bad business deal. And I actually did not know that. So I was like, we have the 70 grand, we can start. So I did all the casting of the movie already. I found all the locations. We found, I found 38 locations for free in Los Angeles. It's like unheard of, right? How'd you do that? Um, meeting, uh, well, we have drive throughs we have grocery stores, we have fast food restaurants, we have nightclubs. Um, it took time, you know, and I didn't want to put dates down for the film until I found locations and found all my actors. I did not want to have a date because I was working every day on it anyway. It was, I didn't need a time to like push me. I was working on it every day. So I didn't put a date down for the film yet, but I would, every location we needed, I would go out there and I, if it was a fast food restaurant, I'd walk into every fast food restaurant I could and be like, hey, can we use this space to shoot? You know, I would, can I speak to the manager and talk to them? Chains basically would all turn me down. It's a corporate decision. So I learned very quickly, I need to find mom and pop places, mom and pop grocery stores, mom and pop fast food places. Basically, I need to be able to talk to the person that's making the decision and not have a million, you know, lines to get to who I need to talk to. And it was just convincing people with passion, really. And uh, it was my first feature. My, my butt was on the line. And um, I think they saw how much excitement I had. And uh, a lot of people just agreed to help me. And, um, and then sometimes it was a connection through somebody else. And... Um, you know, like the grocery store was a connection through Seth. It was a friend of his from college who knew somebody who owned a grocery store. And they gave us permission to shoot there. And then we went there on the day and they didn't know who we were. <laughs> you know, somebody <laughs> didn't even tell them. But they saw the camera and the crew and they were excited and they ended up letting us shoot there. I don't even know if we needed permission to shoot there because they didn't know who we were. Oh my goodness. Um, and we shot the grocery store when it was open. So it was like, my actors were joking and the, we have a, a 35 minute documentary on YouTube. Actually, people can type in Wally got wasted behind the scenes and it'll pop right up as a 35 minute little documentary about how we made the film. But one of the actors in the documentary is like live theater, you know, because there's homeless people walking by, there's regular people walking by in the middle of the shot when we're shooting, you know, um, but we made it work, you know. And um, yeah, so just convincing uh, every location to let us shoot there. And some of these locations would back out the day before because it would be like, like the fast food restaurant was like, I need to come there tomorrow night. Between, after He said, okay, come after you close. We closed at 10. I said, okay. He said, well, how long do you need to be here? He's thinking I need to be there like an hour, you know? No, we need to shoot until the sun comes up. Like I need as much time as possible. So normally we'll try to shoot 12 hours, but I have the sun. So we'll shoot from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. And he's like, oh, I have to stay here till 5 a.m. <laughs> like, he immediately was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was like, listen, you, you can't bail on me. Like, if you bail on me, I have nothing. I'm completely screwed. So I would convince him to stay, basically. And, and that's, that would happen a lot. So, yeah. Rewind all the way back to Seth uh, getting that money stolen from him. I, that happened, so I thought we were shooting the movie for 70 grand, and, um, and to rewind, Seth had a business, Seth was going to put in 40 grand, stole that 40 grand, so he didn't know until the first day of shooting. So basically the whole first day of shooting, you see photos and videos of him, and he's, you can see he's like having a nervous breakdown, his like eyes like half open, and you know, because he has, still has to tell me that he lost all that money. And so we have our first day of shooting, and we finally get back because he moved back into my apartment to shoot the movie. Uh, and he comes into my room after like 14 hours of shooting of the day and he goes, he just completely is like, is destroyed and he's like, I lost all the money, we have to shut the movie down. And I was like, Seth, I, I gotta tell you, there's nothing in the world that can stop me from shooting this movie at this point. Like, no, we're not gonna stop. We use the 30 grand and we'll put the rest on credit cards. Me and you will open credit cards and we're gonna finish the movie. We'll put everything we possibly can on credit cards but we will not stop the movie. And he, he, he came in my room and was like, we're gonna shut down the movie, I'm gonna move from, away from Los Angeles and I'm done with this dream, I'm never gonna do it again. And I was like, no, you're gonna finish your dream and, and we're gonna drive forward. And I, I wouldn't let him quit, I was like, we, we have to do this. And so that's what we did. We put the rest of the movie on, we put 40 grand or something on credit cards and 30 grand we used to pay the crew and the people we needed to pay, but, uh, and we finished it.
So, yeah. You had said 30 feature films is one of your goals? Um, that's in my head. I, I know that I want to do a lot of movies. I, I don't have a set at 30 in my, you know, I say that to people so they understand that I'm doing this for the rest of my life and I'm going to make a lot of movies. And I think it'll get easier and easier. So eventually I might be making a movie a year, you know what I mean? But it's when my team around me and my financiers and all these kinds of things are, are moving faster. You know, now it'll be, it'll be, in the beginning it'll be less movies because it's harder to make a movie now. You know, it's harder to raise the money, it's harder to, you know, find the right crew and all that kind of stuff. But as I make more and more things, there's certain crew members that I'm like, yep, yeah, I'll use him every time uh, as long as he's available. You know, I want to use the same script supervisor, I want to use the same, you know, gaffer, I want to use whatever. So you, you, you get a team going on as you make more and more things. And that's part of the learning too, you know. Because when you're on a movie, everyone's sleep deprived, you know what I mean? Everyone's, it's rough, it's, it's a rough situation. So everybody's underpaid and overworked. So you see people's true colors. Some people lose it, some people get angry, some people curse. Um, and you really don't want, it affects the movie. You know, you really don't want negativity on a set. It spreads like wildfire. I've been on enough movies to know. Once some one person starts complaining, other people start complaining, and then they start making fun of the movie, and then the whole thing goes to shitty. So I try to get rid of negativity on my set, and hopefully I can fire the person or get rid of them if it's my movie, um, and just get rid of them because it's like, well, if you don't want to be here, you should just go, you know, and replace them. I had to replace. I've only had to kick one person off my set, and I've only had to fire one person in my career, so I'm, I'm lucky that way. But. Um, I try to vet people pretty well, um, but sometimes when you're in the middle of it too, it's very hard to get rid of somebody, you know. Um, in the middle of making a movie, try, you know, if you're in the middle of a war, you can't exactly replace the guy shooting the gun next to you if he's bad. So you just got to roll with it sometimes, but then you won't use that person again, you'd use somebody else. Um, because keeping your cool and having a positive attitude is so, so important. Well, and there's a lot of people that love to, in the quote vein of good advice, tell you things, mm -hmm. and you're never sure what their angle is. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of agendas here. And so I think that, um, I find it interesting that you had someone tell you that you couldn't do the film, and they were just, quote, trying to be honest with you, and maybe they were, but were you able to then kind of like brush that off and keep going, or was, did it kind of fuel you and you had a chip on your shoulder a little bit? I think anyone who's gonna make it in this industry, like people telling you you can't do it has to be your fuel. Cause you're gonna hear that a lot. If you're an actor, if you're a director, whatever position you are, uh, especially the, the more higher up creative positions, people are gonna doubt you. And if you let that discourage you, you're not gonna get to where you need to be. And even if you believe some of the things they say, you have to learn, you have to admit to yourself that you're learning. You're always learning to get better, you know what I mean? I've, I've seen interviews with Steven Spielberg, he says he's still learning, you know what I mean? So everybody's learning as they go and um, take it easy on yourself, you know? In my opinion, you know, while he got wasted, uh, people seem to love the movie and they laugh a lot, but is it the best movie I'm ever gonna make? I hope not, I hope I get better and make even better movies, you know? And everything that I learned on this movie, I can take to the next movie, you know? So. Do you have a barometer for when you think that you've quote unquote made it? That's a good question. I think a lot of people have a really tough time with that too, because I even see interviews of big actors and stuff and they, they're, the struggle is so real. They have so many years of not working or trying to get a job that even when they become a movie star or a TV star, they're constantly trying to take as much work as possible. They don't want to turn anything down. They're scared to make a mistake because the moment you turn something down, you might not work for a year. So I think everyone has a, a struggle with trying to get where the pinnacle of where you want your career to go. I'm lucky because I, I mean, at this point in my career, and I think for the rest of my career, I never, I don't know, I would do this for free. So it's a, it's a little different, you know, like a lot of people, they hang on to money or this and that. and. For me, if I'm not motivated by the creativity of it, I, I don't think I could do it. I've turned down jobs already where people want to pay me to direct things, and I, if I don't vibe with the material, I, I just can't do it. And that's something I've learned in my life in general. If I'm not heartfelt about something, I can't do it. Like you know, in my life, I tried to get my, I got my real estate license, and I did other things, but without the passion, I, I'm just not effective. 
compared to something I'm effective about. You can't stop me when I'm creative and passionate about something. But when I'm not, it's very easy to stop me. <laughs> Are those the, is that your Libra scales? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I think that Balance. more comes into play with my negotiating skills with people. You know, and, and like a lot of the movie was negotiating, you know, and the scales is like, well, what do you want? You know, try to figure out what they want. And if I can help them get what they want, either promise them that I'll help them later or give to them what they want now. But what I don't have right now is money. So whatever I got to do to get you to help me at the moment, I will do. But money I don't have to give to you. So it has to be something else. So, you know, and like you hire a DP, but he's only DP TV shows or he's only done this or that, but he wants a feature. You got to find that person, you know, you got to find the people that they want what you want. And that's the reason that they're helping you. You know, you, you know, they haven't done a feature or wh whatever, you know, and same with actors. You find a really talented actor that hasn't been a lead in a feature yet. Well, he's going to show up every day for free if you want him to, because he's doing his dream too, just like you're doing your dream. And that's a problem for a lot of people. They go, oh, please help me. And they go up to the people at the top and want them to help you. Well, these people are making a living. They have no reason to take a chance on you. It's the people to your left and the people to your right that you need to depend on and build and grow together. Uh, Do you think that part of making it is never feeling satisfied? Because then you're, you're always looking for that next thing. And if you were complacent or content with something, you wouldn't. I think uh, I, a lot of people, I think, have that. They have a pinnacle of what they want in their head. For me, like I said, I would do this for free. I, I love doing this. So I would just keep doing it. Whether, you know, uh, I secretly, I mean, I got to convince people to give me money to make movies sometimes, and I do. And I, I mean what I say when I think it's going to make money, but I would do it if I, I didn't make a dollar. So um, I love telling stories. I love seeing the reactions of people laugh. I love, you know, I don't want to always do comedies, but comedies are very rewarding because you know if it's good or bad of people because they're either laughing or they're not. So that's one thing about everything I've done so far has been mostly comedy um, that I've, everything that I've written and directed has been comedy. And it's very easy in a theater to know that they're liking it or they're not liking it. So it's been interesting. <laughs> With Wally Got Wasted, did you have to do, redo the first 10 minutes to appease the distributor? Or, or was that already sort of built in because you knew that? So Wally Got Wasted, actually, uh, we got offers from a lot of distribution companies, but we ended up self-distributing. So we actually are self-distributing the movie. We, we don't have a distributor. Oh. Um, I, we went through an aggregator to get on all the platforms. Right now, we're exclusively on Amazon. People can get it on Amazon and rent and buy it on Amazon. Uh, we we'll go on iTunes, I think, and Video Demand, um, uh, Vudu, and a bunch of other platforms here in the next week or so, I believe. Um, and we just did it through an aggregator. You pay an aggregator, and they put it on the platforms. And because mostly all the distribution companies that we talk to, none of them were going to put any money in advertising. And I was like, well, what are you actually doing? You know? And they would come up with things like, oh. Um, you know, all the big companies, because we're a distribution company, that you'll get higher on the algorithms to be seen by people. And I'd be like, well, where's the proof of that? I mean, like, you're telling me this magical story of like, oh, I signed with you, everyone's going to see my movie on the platform compared to paying an aggregator to getting on there. But there was absolutely no proof to that. It was just something the distributors would say. And I was like, there's no proof to it. I, I can't. I can't drink the Kool-Aid, you know what I mean? So that and, um, you know, we, had, we, we have money that we're putting in advertising, so we're doing that ourselves. And also, we wouldn't see, now that we paid an aggregator, we can see how, you know, from the advertising, who actually buys the movie on the platform. Well, we can't with Amazon, unfortunately, their algorithms isn't as good, but on iTunes and some of these others, we should be able to run an advertisement they can click on the advertisement, and then we can follow to see if they actually buy or rent it. But Amazon, unfortunately, we can't do that yet. Hopefully, they fix that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we decide not to go with the distributor. And uh, distributors want they want someone twenty percent, want someone thirty percent, someone forty percent, um, and some of them. I mean, that's the thing. If you're an independent movie and you're not going to put any money into advertising, you're not putting any energy into advertising, you have no interest in it then some of these distribution companies are a good option because they put 10, sometimes 20,000 into getting you on all the platforms and all the countries and all these kinds of things. And you don't have to put out that 20 grand. But if you want to 
banking yourself, which, you know, me and Seth that we're talking about, it's like we've banked on ourselves every step of the way here, you know, from making the movie ourselves to now distributing ourselves. We banked in ourselves. So let's just continue to do that. And um, I hustled my butt off to try to get the word out and get people to know about it. And we casted seven big social media people in the movie. We have seven big YouTubers, Instagrammers that would hopefully spread the word and they do videos and stuff on it too. So you have that as well. Um, but it's exciting. It's all, it's exciting getting the word out there and working on it. And I see the numbers coming every day. You know, there's sometimes we have 150 people ran or buy the movie in one day. And it's like, you know, some, some weeks it's like that every day. And like, wow, on a Wednesday, 140 people paid money to watch my movie. It's insane to me. It's crazy and rewarding and, and exciting, you know, so. What are some things you learned in the last five years that you wish you knew in the first five years that you'd moved here? Um, some of it plays into some things I've already said, but number one is the bank in yourself. If you really believe in yourself, you have to bank in yourself. And what that means is you can't depend on an external person to make your dreams happen. If you want to make them happen, you go make them happen yourself. Now, actors, some actors are very much independent of a studio or a filmmaker if you're not a filmmaker yourself. But even an actor, in a way, you could find the right director. You could find money people. You could then produce and put a whole project together. But it's to bank in yourself. It's to start learning and figure out what you need to do and do it. Do it yourself. We've, Wally What Waste we've done completely outside of the studio system and it would have never got made if I was, I'd still be scratching my head handing in the script to people and even though people love the script, I'd still be handing it to people and even the people that might have wanted to make it, they weren't going to make me the director. Who, who are you? So I had to do it to learn and to prove myself, you know, that's another thing that I've learned is people, like I said, people don't see potential. You have to show them there. I, I, I'm the same person I was five or six years ago when I was telling people, you know, I'm going to be a film director. They don't really believe me. They don't really know. There's so many people that say things in this town. Now they treat me with totally different respect and they look at me like a filmmaker. So it's very interesting in that way. It's like, you know what you're going to do or what you're capable of. So go do it and show people. Don't, don't trust that they see it too. They're not going to see it. You have to show them. What would you say to people though that aren't as confident with themselves? Maybe they're not confident with the way they look. I mean, you're a handsome man, you're tall, you present yourself well. So it's easy for me to see why people, aside from talent, would mm -hmm. want to believe in you. But not everybody has that. So what would you say to people that don't feel like they have it? Um... It's funny though, because I'm motivated, but that kind of goes into your motivation. I'm, I'm actually motivated by people not believing me in a way. I mean, I have a lot of support and a lot, my father and a, my mother and my family believe in me a lot, but I'm actually more motivated by people that tell me I can't do something. And I don't know, I don't know how healthy that is, but <laughs> that's what it is. And I think, I think ultimately if you're not, you have to start looking at yourself. You have, then then the, start, the work doesn't start with with making films. The work starts inner and then you need to go look at yourself, analyze yourself and really build yourself up, maybe with positive reinforcement every morning, med maybe meditation, whatever it is, build yourself up to believe the belief that you can do it. Because without the belief, I mean, you're not going to do it. You, you know, if you believe what people tell you, you know, uh, I think everybody who's ever done anything amazing, they were told they can't do it. And if they believed it, they would never would have done it. So. You know, the fact that it's never been done before just makes me excited that, you know, I'll be the first, you know, so, you know. So it's more a challenge when someone, <clears throat> polite or not, says no to you because then, it, rather than somebody who seems more like, oh yeah, that sounds great to you, that's maybe not enough of a challenge? I don't look forward to it. It's not like I'm like, oh, please tell me no. Um, but it, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, a, a, you know, it's a fire inside you. You tell me no, and I'm like, why do you want to get in my way? I'm going to win, you know, no matter what. So uh, I'm going to make this happen. And, you know, and I have good intentions with it. I'm not, I'm not trying yeah. to uh, d defeat anybody, but um, I have my goals and my dreams and, and, and my belief in it is, is, 
you know, you can't, your belief in you and what you want to do just can't waver. It cannot. And that's the first place to work on. If, if you don't have that belief, you need to work on it and get it before you even take on the beast of a feature or any dream, you know, that you have. Because I'm sure curing cancer, the people working on it right now, they believe they're going to cure it no matter what. And you couldn't tell them, you couldn't convince them that they weren't going to cure it, even though they haven't done it yet. But that's the kind of belief that you need to have and determination to accomplish your dreams, no matter what they are. Since your time in Hollywood, what, 2006, when have you been your most broke? <laughs> uh, when I first got here. Um, I actually slept in my car one night when I first got here. Um, I stayed with my brother for a while and his girlfriend at the time was tired of me being there. And so they were like, you got to get out. And so I slept in my car one night or two. And then I ended up staying with another friend for a while. Um, in the beginning, yeah. I, uh, I've always been decent with saving money. I've been lucky in that way. So it didn't take long for me to get a job waiting tables and start saving up and stuff. Um, but I've never been like $50,000 in credit card debt, um, except for making the movie. So, I mean, that was probably our brokest point was after we made the movie, probably that's the truth of it. Uh, Cause we had $40,000 of credit card debt. And at that point, I had already saved up. I saved up 15 grand to put into the movie. So I already put my, all my savings into the movie and we had 40 grand of credit card debt. So that was probably my brokest point is after we made the movie. Um, but you know, it, that, it was, I never, I never second guessed it once and I was proud and happy to do it, so. So you slept in your car. Do you remember uh, what street, what town that was? That's interesting. Uh, where was I? I think I was in El Segundo. Oh, okay. um, that's about, I live down in the South Bay now in Redondo Beach and uh, I ended up sleeping in my car that first night. I had all my stuff in it too. It was pretty crowded. Um, but I was 23 at the time, so you could almost get away with it. Nowadays, I think I'd be like, Ugh, wake up, you know. <laughs> Once you hit your early 30s, you're, you're not quite the same anymore. But um, yeah. That was, that was my hardest time in LA and not knowing anybody other than my brother. You know, when I first moved here, I had no friends. I didn't know anybody. And, uh, and eventually you start kind of getting a family. You know, I, I was lucky. I, I did acting school. And so every, you're, you're surrounded by people that are going through the exact same thing that you're going through starting out in LA. And, um, and so you, you kind of become a family, you know, and, and so you get new friends that way and, you know, all kinds of ways. And, it becomes, it comes your family here in Los Angeles. And I'm sure a lot of people have the same feeling when they come to LA, they kind of start a, a, a new family in a way. Uh, Cause a lot of people come here not knowing anybody. One of the common themes you've talked about is um, things not going as planned. Yeah. My sense is you like to plan, you like to be organized, is that right? I very much do. I, I don't understand. Um, I was helping a friend recently plan a, a movie shoot and uh, he has all these things handwritten on a paper. I'm like, all right, well, let's type it out on the computer and get every single location and the address on, on, a, on a page and every single actor and you know, every location we're going to shoot what time of day. And it's like, why are we doing this? And I'm like, what do you mean, why are we doing this? Like, you have all the information in your brain, but you're going to have a crew of, you know, 15 people, maybe more, maybe less. But these people, they have to know what you're thinking and you can't always be the one telling them. It's very easy to hand all this information so everybody already has it all. And when they forget it, they just look at the piece of paper. You know, you have to save that time. So, no, everything's about organization with the whole thing. And um, you have to organize to the last detail because when you get there on the day, it's not going to go how you planned. And there's always problems that arise. With Wally Got Wasted, there was so many different problems that arise. I mean, for one, certain locations we couldn't afford permits. You know, certain places we had permits, certain places we didn't. Um, we got shut down one day. You know, other days I'd convince security guards and police officers to let us keep shooting, you know. And uh, all while he got wasted, um, <clears throat> for starters, I convinced the crew from Teen Wolf, the TV show, to come over all my movies. So it was like all the same people who had worked together previously. I'm the new guy as the boss, you know what I mean? So that was a really interesting dynamic. But they want nothing to do with cops or security guards. Like if they're a union crew, so if they, you know, if they get any 
see a cop or a security guard, they just stop working. They don't want anything to do with them. They want no trouble, no nothing. So it's on me to fix those problems. So I might be acting in the scene and a security guard comes up and I'm like finishing the take real quick and then turn and, and take care of my, my problem over here and, and then hopefully convince them and then come back and do my take or, or direct or whatever I'm doing at the time. So, and the only place we got shut down actually was my apartment, which is the funniest thing ever. Um, there was one day we got shut down in my apartment and uh, basically the, the scene, it's the iconic scene in the movie actually, the first time they bring the body out in public and it's a slow motion scene and they're walking with the body. And actually if you look at Patrick who um, plays Mitch in the movie, he looks left in the slow motion scene and he's looking at a woman who's screaming at us going, where's your apartment? I'm gonna shut you down. And that's why he's looking left, but it's in slow motion. You barely, you know, you have no idea what he's looking at. He just glances left. That's who he's looking at. Some woman screaming at us, telling us, you know, where's your permit? And so I managed to get that take done. And then I went up to the woman and was like, hey, I'm so sorry. Did somebody bother you? Are we bothering you? How can I help you? She was like, I want to see your permit. And I was like, okay, well, um, I just sent somebody to go get the permit. So why don't we just, um, I'm going to shoot one more and then, and then you know, and then I'll, I'm sure somebody will be back to show you the permit. And she's like, I need to see it now. I'm calling the cops. And she has the phone right there. And I'm like, okay, I try my best. You know, so I, I was like, guys, we're shutting it down. Everybody wanted to kill her. You know, the crew, they just set up all these giant lights and everything, the cast. And uh, I was like, don't talk to her, don't bother her. Because I fully know that we have to come back there three days later at that date and shoot with cops and fake guns and all these other I can't have the cops be called now, but how the heck am I going to shoot here in three days? So I'm like, no one to speak to her, just leave her alone. And then one of my actors said to her, it was so funny, Wally, James Babson, who plays Wally, he does a phenomenal job. He goes, way to destroy art. You know, and he passes her, which is just so funny to me because we're making like a, a silly comedy movie. But, um, and then, Actually, when we came back there three days later, she did end up calling the cops. And uh, luckily, she didn't do it in the daytime. So there's a scene in the movie where some dirty cops shoot somebody. And um, that was in the daytime. And luckily, we're between the two buildings and no one called the cops because if a cop came up and saw us with fake guns and police uniforms, they probably would have shut us down. But <clears throat> cops didn't get there till nighttime. And uh, we saw the cop come and he posts up about, I don't know, 50 yards from my apartment on the street, just parks there and just watches. And luckily at that point we were shooting all the SUV car scenes. So we, would, we brought this SUV between the two buildings and we set up all the lights on the hood pointing inward and the cameras on, uh, attached to the hood of the car. And how are we gonna leave? The cops right there, we can't drive around with this stuff on there and nobody should do that. I'm not encouraging anyone to do this at all, you should get a tow truck and, and not drive a car with lights pointing at your face and a camera. But we, we had to do what we had to do at that moment. Um, and so basically, we, I, I got out of the car, I turned off all the lights, I turned off the camera, and luckily there's no street light right outside of my apartment. So when we pulled out, you could only see the headlights of the car. And I turned left away from the cop and we would drive down the street and then I'd get out and turn out all the, on all the lights and turn on the camera. And then we would just drive slowly on these residential roads and shoot the scenes. So, or park in a parking lot and shoot the scenes if you couldn't see out the windows. So that's what we did. And then we'd come back after 30, 40 minutes of shooting and drive past the, not past the cop, but close enough that he could see us, but there was no street light. So he couldn't, see, I, I'm assuming he, could, he couldn't see the camera on the hood and the, and the lights. And uh, we managed to get away with the whole thing. So my luck coming into play once again. So, and then other days, um, you know, like we, we shot at a casino and, uh, and we had no business being at the casino. We didn't have permits, but I'm showing up with a, a, a you know, three ton grip truck and, and a crew of 15, 20 people. They, the nice part is we're so big that people assume we must have permission to be there because there's no way you would come and try to shoot there without permission. And uh, we're shooting at the, the parking lot of the casino and the two security guards come up and they're like, um, it was like a scene out of Superbad. They're like, do, where's your permit, guys? Where's your, do you guys have a permit? You know, and my friend David Lee who was helping with the movie 
goes, yeah, we have a permanent. And then they laugh and they go, because <laughs> if you don't, we don't give a shit. <laughs> and they laughed and then they left. They didn't end up even looking at trying to look at a permit. So it was, again, luck came into play there. And um, <clears throat> another place, um, a security, the head of security came and he came at the absolute wrong time. That, um, because we were running next to something and it was slightly dangerous what we were doing and it should have never been done in the first place, but I was looking at the footage, um, uh, focused on the camera, and the first AD was trying to get more footage and she was, she was like, yeah, Ron, run, Ronald Quigley was in the movie, one of my actors uh, who, uh, who plays a dirty cop, run next to that moving object, you know, and he did, and it's not really safe to do that. And then the head of security comes up right as he's doing that. It's like the worst possible time he could come. And, and he was like, whoa, whoa, what are you guys doing here? Like, this is not safe. Uh, you need a permit to be here. And it took like 20, 30 minutes to talk to him and convince him to let us stay there. Um, and at the beginning, he was totally against it. But I was like, I saved up. This is my life savings. Like, I saved up all my money. And this is, I'm shooting a big YouTube video. Uh, because the moment you say a feature, they assume you have money. So I just told them it was a YouTube video and um, you can't shut me down and da 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 da. And you just, please, please, please. And eventually, after 20 minutes of hearing me sob and, and talk, you know, and be sweet and nice, because I was never mean to him, he said, fine, you can shoot, but don't, uh, don't shoot there. Shoot, you know, you can shoot on the stairs, which is like, doesn't make any sense to me. You can shoot on the stairs in the parking lot. Well, luckily in scheduling, I knew the hardest place would shoot would be where most of the pedestrians were. So we shot that first. And that's where he said you couldn't shoot anymore. Well, I already had all the footage I needed up there. So, and only one more take I needed up there. I figured we'd do it last now that we got shut down. And we shot the stairs in the parking lot next. And so I scheduled just perfect, knowing that we had so much time. And when you show up with a crew that I showed up with, you usually have some time if you start shooting right away before people shut you down because they're wondering what you're doing there and they don't come up and shut you down right away. And I actually had a defense for that because the crew sees a security guard or a cop, they immediately don't do anything. So I would ha sometimes I would just go up to a cop or a security guard and be like, hey, how you doing? Are you having a good night? Yeah? When do you get off? Oh, that's awesome. Cool. Well, have a great night, you know, and I would just walk away. I would just make small talk and walk away and the crew would see me talk to the security guard or the cop and be like, oh, okay, he squared everything away, we're good. When really, in fact, I just talked to him about their day and, and was friendly. But see, after I'm friendly too, they assume I must be there because people that don't, they're not supposed to be with her, they, they shy away, they act like they're being sneaky. No, I just come up completely, confront you, be super nice and walk away. So they'd be like, oh, do you know about this? They'd ask probably their so, other security guard, do you know this movie shooting here? Like, <laughs> well, let's call the boss, you know, like, and they'd call maybe their boss and they don't know and then they call their boss. Well, meanwhile, I already had an hour and a half to shoot. So I got some footage. And so that's a lot of part of the scheduling is like you, you have to try to think of those kind of problems and, and solve them. So, um, yeah, that, that was. And sometimes cops would just be like, oh, we saw you shooting a movie. If I have a lot of uh, important equipment, we're just keeping an eye on you. And they would just watch us. But uh, I wasn't in Hollywood. I was in South Bay. So or I was in Pasadena or somewhere where, you know, the cops, if you do it in Hollywood, you probably are gonna get shut down. And some places you definitely do get shut down. I don't encourage people not to have a permit, you know, but we had to take the chance because we just didn't have the money. So, you know, mm -hmm. we'd go for it. <laughs> There's a cave scene in the movie. We go to this gigantic, we go to this gigantic cave in the movie. Um, and the ending scene is like in this big cave. And so we found that location as a movie ranch like two hours north of Los Angeles. Um, and they were building the cave when we went there two months earlier. And I was like, oh, this is great. They're like, you know, what they do is they dig a hole in the ground, basically. And so the walls of the cave are real dirt, but then they build the top of the cave over with construction and then, you know, do dry mold or whatever, make it look like dirt. And then they put lights in there, so then you have total control in the cave to make it look the way you want. So I went two months earlier before shooting and, and paid for the location and was like, oh, this is great. We're going to be the first people shooting in this giant, beautiful cave, and I'm super excited about it. Well, the day before shooting, the day before we're going to go up there, they tell us basically that the cave is not finished. The, the half the cave is finished, and the other half, 
uh, is not done at all. So, you know, you can't shoot here. And I'm like, we're coming to shoot there. We have a contract. I, I can't not go there now. So I was like, I sent Seth, my, Seth Himes, my partner, my writing partner, producing partner up there to take pictures of it. So I ended up having to shoot the scene facing one direction because you can't, you have to face only one direction in that scene. So every, every shot in that whole scene is facing one direction, but you don't know. So I'm talking to you, behind you is the same wall that's behind me. We just lit it different. And so that was the solution to that problem is like, we went up there and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to just have to shoot everything in one direction. So I had to keep in my head when people walk, like what direction they were and what direction we shot and, um, and light the wall differently. So the cracks, because it's not a flat wall, to make it look different. And it was really hard for my DP and the people around me to trust that I could do that in my head. You know, but no one's ever mentioned it. No one has ever noticed that, that in the movie. So when you watch the movie, it's facing all one direction. <laughs> So, yeah. Which problems do you like figuring out more? Which is, which is a better challenge for you? The problems that come up as a director, because most of them are out of your control, they're mm. all external things, or as a screenwriter, they're really internal. They're about you cracking the story somehow. Um, I mean, they're very different. Um, the nice part about the screenwriting process for me um, and Seth is that we didn't have a time limit. You know, we didn't have a, you know, some people have to write scripts for pay and they have a time limit and they have to rush through things. We had enough time to really figure out problems and also just do rewrites after rewrite after rewrite to try to get it right. And sometimes, you know, like originally in the original script, it, in the movie, While He Got Wasted, we have dirty cops chasing us because, um, spoiler alert, uh, Wally, Wally actually filmed them kill somebody. So then they're ch on his phone. So they're chasing us the whole movie, trying to get his phone back because he tried to blackmail them. But he's dead the whole time. They don't know he's dead. So they're chasing us, trying to get that phone. And, um, <clears throat> and in the writing, originally, those were mafia guys. And it just didn't really work in the writing process. And I think... I just uh, kind of obsess. That's one of the reasons why it's hard for me to start a project because like once I'm in it, I'm obsessive. And so I would obsess and obsess, obsess trying to fix the problem. And I think in a dream, actually, I came up with them being dirty cops. And then I wake up in the morning and I like have the solution. And I was like, dirty cops, perfect. Back when we wrote it, now it's like, of course, dirty cops. They're everywhere. There's all this footage of them killing people and all these kinds of things. Back then, we, this is 2014. I think there was like one incident of a cop shooting a guy. So it wasn't so prevalent as, as it is now. Um, so it was kind of like, ah, I came up with the perfect idea. Now it's kind of, I guess, obvious to a lot of people of, of uh, the biggest villains would be dirty cops. But back then it wasn't like that. So, I mean, that's how it tied all together. And I came up with the dirty cops. I also came up with the phone and recording them because we needed, we needed to move the story forward and having people chase us. And it was figuring out how do we do that? How do we have somebody chase us? And why are they chasing us? And all that kind of stuff. And so I came up with dirty cops were filmed doing a dirty deed and they're chasing us to get the evidence. That was, that was like the, one of the key elements of writing it. It was like, okay, this can move the story forward. So, but the problems on set, totally different because of very time restraint, you know, it's like, we're going and we're shooting no matter what. I can't stop this train. So if a cave isn't fi finished, we have to fix it. If the grip truck gets a flat tire, with our, which our grip truck got a flat tire one day, it was like, well, what can we shoot without the lights? Because we don't have lights right now, you know? Um, so there's just all these kinds of problems, you know, that, that come up on the day and you just have to fix them. And you can't, there's no time as a film director, like I'm asking, I'm answering questions every single second of the day as a director. I'm also, I was also acting in the film, so I got to focus on my lines and delivery and all that stuff and, and helping actors, but I'm still answering questions. Do you want this? Do you want to wear this? Do you want her to wear this blouse or this blouse? What color do you want? Oh, I want that one. Um, do you like the lighting over here? Is this too dark, too light? I'm getting asked a question almost every 60 seconds. So you have to be fast when you ask me a question. I don't have time for you to give me a song and a dance about why something's wrong. Just tell me what's wrong so we can fix it. And 
I try not to ever turn down ideas that people want to give ideas. I just usually tell them, okay, I, I have a plan for this, so I'm going to do what I planned, and, and we're going to get to that afterwards. And if I don't like it, we're not going to get to it. But I don't have to tell you that. You know, I'll just say we ran out of time. But I don't want to ever turn any ideas down because that's the moment people stop giving me ideas. And it needs to be a creative space for people to share ideas, you know, and, and speak their mind. And do it in an appropriate way, though, because I do have limited time and I am doing certain things. So if you're the, there's a certain time to give me a, an idea. Most of it, hopefully, in pre-production. I have table reads, I have, you know, I try to get people together so they can be part of the creative process. So when we get on set, you're not like, oh, I have an idea I've been wanting to tell you. No, you should have done that when we were rehearsing. You know what I mean? That's why I do all that time. And I go to every single location with the DP and tell them every shot that I want to do and the look that I want. And we, as much as you can do ahead of time, it really helps you when you're making the movie because the unforeseeable problems come up. And if you haven't discussed the things you can discuss ahead of time, you might not get a chance to discuss them anymore, you know, um, as to where you could have settled that out in, in pre-production on how it's going to get lit or, you know. I have a shot list, I know all my shots, I know how I'm gonna put it together in my head when we get there. And sometimes there's only one way when you go to editing to put it together. And when I edit the film, I edit with an editor, but I'm there every single day, every single frame, every cut is usually me going, no, don't go back a millisecond, cut there, you know, because he hands it to him here and I, I needed his hand out, like I know exactly where I wanna cut usually. Um, and I hear some directors actually edit in camera. I mean, it's so, they hype that up. I'm just like, it's so not important nowadays. It's just funny. It doesn't matter if you, if you cut it. You don't have to cut it. You might as well film for 20 more seconds. You're not paying for film. But anyway, it's, it's another topic. <laughs> with Wally Got Wasted, it sounds like it was, it was a fun project with you and Seth. And there were no time constraints in the writing. Have you had a screenwriting project where there was time constraint? And what happened? I've been lucky. I haven't had a script that, well, no, that's not true at all, actually. Three guys on a couch. No, we raised the money. And so I had a month. I had a month to write that script, actually. So no, very much I've had a time restraint. Um, it's just really, really obsessing over it and really trying to get it good. And three guys on a couch is about three guys running out their couch. And, <clears throat> and I had two storylines. Uh, the one guy woke up and he has a girl um, that he thinks he slept with in his room, but he doesn't really remember anything because he drank too much. And he's trying to figure out like what this woman's doing there, but he assumes he slept with her and she's cleaning and she's doing all this stuff. And he's like, man, she's like the best woman I've ever met. Like she's cleaning the bathroom after I've only slept with her once. So he's trying to figure that out and she keeps appearing. Like she leaves the apartment. He's like, okay, cool. I'll never see her again. He comes home and she's cooking. What are you doing in my apartment? Oh, I'm just cooking us food, you know? And I cleaned this and that, and he's going, oh man, wow, who is this woman? But okay, he's clueless. At the same time, we're doing couch interviews, trying to fill the couch to make rent because we don't have enough money for rent. So I was, in the writing process, I was like, how do I connect these two stories? And just obsessing over it, obsessing over it, because they need to be connected for it to be good. And so I eventually figured out, okay, this woman that he woke up and is there, he rented the couch out last night to this woman and he doesn't remember. So they already have filled the couch, the whole episode, but they don't realize it. So that's how the two storylines are tied together. And so then I was like, oh wow, that makes a lot of fun dialogue where she's talking about renting the place and he's talking about sex. And they're totally on two different pages. And so he's very confused by her answers to certain things because he's totally talking about something totally different. So the writing restraints of that was just I mean, it has to be, there's, in my brain, there's only one good enough. And so it's trying to meet that bar. And when you have a time restraint, it's even more obsessive and you've got to X out other things in your life at the moment. I can't pick up my phone or I can't do anything other than this. So it's pure concentration. What happened with that project? <clears throat> uh, we shot it. We ended up shooting Three Guys on a Couch. That was Three Guys on a Couch. It's on Amazon Prime. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. Just like Parole Officers is on Amazon Prime as well for free. And Wally's on Amazon for purchase at the moment and to rent. So, 
But did, did someone else want you to come in and, and make that project, or how did that work with them? Um... Um, it was kind of like the wheels were already turning on Three Guys on a Couch. It was like we had a date already to shoot it. And so that's the thing about raising money for any project. People can tell you they have money, but they don't have money forever. Money just doesn't sit in someone's bank account and they're waiting for you to get around to it. So we raised the money to shoot a TV pilot. And those people that had the money, I didn't want it to go away. So we already had shooting dates. I didn't want to go, hey, listen, we're going to shoot in Jan January, February, March, whatever, when it was December or whatever. So I, I knew that I wanted to stick to those dates. And it was my first time ever shooting anything. So it was like all guns blazing. Let's do this. You know, I didn't want to take any chances. And since then, too, I've learned that lesson over and over again. You know, someone comes up to me and goes, hey, I have this money. I really want to do a movie. And I'm like, I don't have a project yet to, that I want to do. I'm, I'm not sure. Kind of stinks in a way because it's like, man, I wish I had that paperwork in order and the project that I want to do so I can take your money. But I can't take your money if I don't know what I want to do with it yet. You know, so that's happened at least two or three times in my career where somebody has a certain dollar amount and they're like, hey, I'd love to do something with you. And I don't have the project ready yet, you know. And that's the tough part with having, not wanting to ever shoot anything that I'm not passionate about. You know, that's the problem with that. Um, because if I'm not passionate about it, I'm not going to shoot it. Um, I don't want to do it. So your decision to be behind the camera as well, I mean, did you always want to just be in front of the camera or that was just never part of the big goal? The big goal was just to make as many movies as you could. I started out as an actor, actually. So um, I grew up studying acting. I, um, I would study performances like Brando on the Waterfront and, and you know, all the ones I could watch. You know, my, my father and me shared that uh, back when I was a kid, showing me performances and talking about acting. And I always wanted to be an actor. And I actually, I, I tried out for a play when I was in sixth grade and I didn't get it apart. My sister got the a good part in it. And then uh, I had extreme stage fright uh, when it came to auditioning. And then I auditioned for a play, I think, when I was uh, a sophomore in high school and I didn't get it either. And then I eventually auditioned for a play again when I was a junior in high school and she took a chance on me because uh, my auditioning skills weren't that great. And um, I got the play. Uh, and once I finally did it, I, I kind of soared. Um, they ended up naming an award after me my first year acting in the high school, and they hand it out every year now, called the A Ward Award, uh, back at my little high school, Glide High School. And, uh, and then the next following year, I got Best Actor, you know, and uh, I was competing against all these guys that were acting since they were freshmen, and I, I just kind of came in and, and did my thing. But we would sell out every night, you know, um, which was really cool, 300-seater. And uh, most people, I can't say most people, one of the comments of the director, she would do a speech to the, all the actors, and she came back one, it's, it's still one of the best comments I've ever gotten, compliments I've gotten in my career. She gave the speech to all the actors, and then everybody left, and she said, Adam, just do what you do, you know, because a lot of people are out there just to see you. Um, and it was fun. It was fun times. We were doing comedies, and I felt like I had them eating out of my hand, you know, just making them laugh and stuff. And comedy always came natural to me. It's one of the reasons why I've made comedy films now. And uh, I think I started, I always wanted to direct too, of course, but it started with a love for acting. And then I think I start, I went to directing sooner than later because I realized the auditions I were getting in weren't good enough to get to where I wanted to be. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the directing I do now is motivated by my acting in it. Um, and right now, I'm actually hired to write a script and direct a movie, which I might not end up acting in. Um, but I do, I do love directing. But I think a lot of my movies will be because I want to play this character, so I will then direct it. And, you know, they kind of feed each other my motivations as a director and as an actor. So, Sorry, have you already written the script? I'm writing the script now. Um, <clears throat> Um, it's about a book uh, um, called Catch the White Tiger. Uh, it's a book that came out, and the, the guy who wrote the book, Tony Asali, wanted me really to do a movie, and I said, well, I can't make a movie without a script, so then he hired me to write a script, and uh, ultimately wants to hire me to direct the movie, too, which I think will be made in the next couple of years. I, you know, I, uh, I don't have a time restraint on it. I just It's when it's right. You know, We want to make a movie that's 
it's going to be a biopic drama movie, so it's going to be a lot bigger than, than Wally. Um, and we're going to go from the 60s, 70s, 80s. So, I mean, it's, it's going to have a lot, um, a lot of work. And I think it's going to, we're going to shoot in Beirut as well as in the United States. So it's going to be a huge undertaking. And um, part of that is by not rushing. And, and first is making the script what it needs to be. Because it could go in a lot of different directions, you know. You have a lot of different morals and themes in a movie. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it could be inspiring or it could be a drama and a downer. I mean, you can make it in so many different directions on what you want to do. Um, so we have to make those choices and, and figure out what's the... He has a 400-page book I have to make into a 120-page script or whatever. And uh, what parts of his life do I leave out? What parts of his life are important? Uh, for the story that we want to tell. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting process that I'm just starting to, we're starting to outline now and try to figure that stuff out, so. Yeah, it's such a trick with biopics because when they're done right, it's amazing. And then sometimes when they're, when they're rushed, I know there's been certain ones and I won't say which ones, but I wanted so much for them to be good, but it was so rushed. And like they were trying, and, and I yeah. saw, and then there's others that, I, I don't know where the magic is in that, but it's just done in such a way where you could just, you know, you, you feel like you are living that life. And, yeah. and so there's a real... Um, I think my favorite biopics are the ones that you really get to know the character and the motivations of what motivated him to do certain things. I feel like a lot of the biopics nowadays, they kind of get away with just telling you the facts. And it, I kind of, I feel like it's a cop out in a way. I'm like, what motivated this person? What to do the amazing things they did or, or, or terrible things that they did, what motivated them. That's what interests me um, as a film viewer. You know? So hopefully we can achieve those kinds of things which aren't easy. A lot of people, they don't know what motivates them. You know? But as, sometimes as an outsider you can see it. So we'll see. You know, I, I hope it's a very three-dimensional movie and that, that it's a character piece as well as telling the facts of what happened in his life. So. When you were a script reader, did you have any biopics come on to your I don't desk? believe so. I don't believe I ever read a biopic. And that was very much in the 2000s. Biopics weren't like there. And like now, like everybody wants to do biopics, which is funny. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see myself doing a biopic um, at all, actually. I, I, uh, there's a movie I wrote already. It's already written called Attachment Theory. And I saw me shooting that next. Um, it's about a guy, a low-end mob guy who basically works for his uncle and he collects money for people that owe money to his uncle um, who works for the cartel but he's very much like his uncle shields him from doing anything really bad uh, so he just kind of beats people up a little bit that owes them money it's kind of like a rocky character and but he needs money because his dad uh, needs a surgery and can't really walk so he's de desperate need for money so at a meeting with his uncle and some of the heads of the cartel, basically, he speaks out of turn because they need a guy to do a job. And he's like, I'll do the job, not knowing what the job is. So they hand him an address and he goes to East L.A. to, um, to do this job. He doesn't even know what he's doing. He goes in this abandoned house and they've kidnapped a woman. And he has to watch the woman for three days, basically. And he watches the woman in this abandoned house and he ends up falling in love with the girl. And the problem is the kidnapping goes bad, they're gonna come back and kill her. So he has to make a choice either to save this woman's life and take on you know, the cartel and everybody that he knows or to kill the woman. And so of course he, he saves her and, and everything starts going crazy from there. But it's already written, I already have it written and I wanna shoot it. Um, and I will shoot it eventually. Um, I, I wrote it for me to also to play that guy. So, um, but that's, it's called Attachment Theory right now, but I, I have no idea what it would eventually be called because I'm not completely sold on that name. But that's the movie. Um, and I'll get around to making that eventually too. Would you recommend that most actors learn screenwriting? I think as an actor, I think it's important for you to learn as much as you possibly can. The more you can learn behind the camera stuff too, it will help you, you know. And it's the same thing with directors, actually. Um, I hear so many directors saying they're terrified of actors, and I think to myself, what's wrong with you? Take an acting class and start learning about that craft because clearly you need to if they scare you. Um, and I think it's the same for actors. If you direct things, if you know about things. As an actor, now that I'm a filmmaker, I mean, if we were shooting this and I didn't like the way I delivered that line, I would just say it again. 
and then you could cut out the first one. I don't even need to tell you to cut, you know? And so there's all these tricks you can learn as a, as a director. Like, there's a lot of very talented actors that I work with that they don't understand that I can stop you wherever I want to stop you. If you stutter, if you make it, and point, you know, and change the angle on somebody else for a split second and come back to you. Like, you don't have to have an amazing take all the way through. It means nothing to me whether you killed it all the way through, as long as you killed it. If you killed the first half of the take one time and completely bombed it the second half, and then we do a second take and you bomb the first half and then you kill it the second half, I'm good. That's all I need. So that's the thing too. You, as an actor, you should never cut yourself because maybe you did screw up, but I don't care. And neither does anybody else because we're making films now. We're not making theater. So we don't need you to do it good all the way through. And so it, there is an element that you should be learning as a film director uh, about acting, as an actor uh, about the film directing, and about lighting and about everything else. You should know, <clears throat> you should know what lens they're putting on because you got to know your box. You know, is it a 50 millimeter lens? Is it a 200 millimeter lens? Like, what is the what is the frame? So what I can do in the frame? You know, because if it's an extreme close up too, there if you're dealing with the correct, you know top-of-the-line cameras, your depth of field is only so far. So if I move forward like this, I'm out of focus. If I move back, I'm in focus. These are all things you need to know. But a lot of, that's why experience comes into play, because most actors learn from experience things. Like, you don't learn how to be on a camera in an acting class, usually. You know, because what acting class has lenses and, and has depth of field and, and all these, and edit the scene together, you know, you don't learn that stuff. So you have to learn it as you go, as you as you perform your craft and movies and TV and, and that kind of stuff. So, as an actor, have you ever sensed that a director was fearful of you, or intimidated? You know, um, I don't know. I haven't, but maybe I was naive because when you're an actor, you're very focused on what you're doing. You know what I mean? Sometimes I've done. In there was one film I did where I, I had a six-minute take. You know, and I didn't. There's no cutting. You know, he didn't have the time to cut. So he shot me all in one angle for six minutes. That's six minutes of dialogue where I have to know every word on that page. And I want to kill it and kick ass and hit all the moments that I've picked out and decisions I've picked out for that character on how he feels about this line or that line. It's a lot of focus, you know. And especially when Wally got wasted, I'm not really doing so much of a character piece. It's not far from... It's not too hard for me to play that character. So I'm not juggling a lot of hats. But when you're, you, these Academy Award winning actors, they have an accent, they have a limp, they have their face only moves in a certain way when they talk, you know? So it's, every single one of those things takes focus and concentration. And so to, to worry about whether an actor's fear for you is probably the last thing on their brain. They're too focused on their performance and what's going on with them. They're, you know, they're, they're, um, if any other energy is on somebody else, it's on their other actor because that's who's feeding them in the scene. You know, if you don't react to something and they're on camera, then now you're not giving a good performance. You're not listening correctly. And listening, if someone else is on camera with you, listening is so important. And a lot of acting classes, they teach, oh, you need to listen. But that's not necessarily true either because you might be acting with a square or a, a check mark on a wall and the other actor might not even be there. You know, a lot of times in Wally, I didn't have time to, um, I didn't have time to let somebody act with me. We had so much time restraints sometimes. I would give the actor acting with me a lot more time, and then I would give the actor with me a lot more time, and then when it was my turn to act, I would just, okay, I'll do it by myself. I just need the script supervisor. Give me my eye line. I pick my eye line. Okay, this is my eye line. I'm just going to act the whole scene like this and talk to them like they're there, even though they're not there. And then the script supervisor is going to give me the, the other line as fast as he can deliver it. And then I'm going to do my next line so we can speed up the whole process. And if I don't like the way I deliver my line, I'm just going to deliver it again. And we're just going to get through it as fast as possible, which is upsetting in a way because you don't really give your best acting performance. But I'm the director first. I'm an actor second in a way. Um, and eventually, hopefully, as I get better and better, I can take on more character pieces that are harder on acting. Um, 
But I, I, I laugh at some people like, you're acting so good because I think to myself, God, I'm cutting myself so short on these, on these. I'm sometimes giving myself one take, you know, for you to compliment my acting is extremely um, flattering in a way because I can't wait to show people what I really, what kind of chops I have when I really start bite off something, you know, that you can't see me as. And then if I prove that, that's, a, that's the motivation of an actor is to try to do something that you can't see them doing. And, but then convince you that they're really that person. That's the fun part of being an actor, so in my opinion. So anyway, how do you think making Wally Got Wasted helped you to move forward? I think so. Wally Got Wasted is my first feature. So to be moving forward on, after it, um, how does it help me move forward? I think it's 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 kind of amazing, and I try to explain this to people. But until you've done a feature people don't believe you can do a feature because so many people have failed doing a feature. So just a lot more doors open up in a way, you know. People know that you've done it and if it's at least half decent, they think you can do it again, you know. And actually, I think I read something that 99% of filmmakers make their first feature, they never make a feature again. So that's how many people try to do this and then go, I don't want to do that again, this is horrible. You know, because you have to really love film to want to do it because it is so hard. You know, like I said earlier, it's like two, three hours a night I slept on Wally. And how many emergencies would happen or whatever, and everything comes back on me. So if you don't like to be a leader, you're not going to like being a film director. You know, you have to manage egos, you have to manage, um, uh, you have to keep your cool under all circumstances and at the same time make the right decisions. You don't want to put anybody in danger. You don't want to, you know, your movie's important, but we're making a movie. We're not curing cancer. So let's not endanger anybody or do anything that's unsafe. And after you've done your first feature, it's just a totally different respect you get from people. Um, and opportunities open up way more because now you're a real filmmaker, really. I mean, everybody kind of looks at you like an amateur when you're making short films. But after you've made a feature, you're, you're in the pros. I mean, you are. You're competing. Once you make a feature, you're competing with the Avengers. You're competing with all these other movies. There's no scale of like, oh, that movie. No, you're competing with them all because the audience on Amazon can choose Avengers or they can choose Wally Got Wasted. You know, so you're competing with everybody. And that's why I take it easy on myself because, you know, I didn't have $500 million to make a movie. We had 70 grand. So the fact that I'm even competing with these movies and some people are watching my movie, I'm thrilled because there's so much content out there right now to watch. So, but you learn, you know, you learn and, and opportunities, they just open up. They open up and you don't know where they're going to come from after you've done your first feature. So you just got to do it. You got to do it. You got to take the chance. You got to learn. You got to fall on your face and you got to go do it. Even if it never sees the light of day, at least you did it. Do it again. When did you read your first screenwriting book and which, which book was it? Oh, my first one. I think my first one was actually um, Save the Cat, um, which was a really good book and it was about outlining. Um, if anybody wants to be a filmmaker, I would suggest that book, Save the Cat. Um, if you want to be a filmmaker, it lays out structure really well. And uh, now everything doesn't have to be formulaic, but everything's almost been done at this point. So, I mean, even when I'm making the movie now, where I'm making a, this movie about the book, Catch the White Tiger, it's, about, it's a biopic. So I go and I watch all biopics and what, what kind of biopic do I want to make? Wolf of Wall Street is very different than the founder. You know what I mean? So the blueprint's there in a way, you know? So, that helps you make a blueprint, um, that book. And, um, but I feel like books were helpful. That's a very helpful book, but I felt like watching movies was the most helpful for me. You know, like my brother, who's my writing partner, will send me scripts and be like, here, you know, he just sent me like three scripts yesterday of all these biopics. I'd rather watch the movies because I'm very much, I know that a script can change so much in, compared to making the movie. And so when you're seeing it in the movie, it might be an improv, it might be whatever, but that could still be a script. It, even if maybe it wasn't a script, it could have been a script if you would have wrote it that way. So I kind of like watching the final product more than reading the script um, in the sense of learning. 
uh, when it comes to like Goodfellas, reading the script or watching the movie. I'd rather watch the movie and analyze that um, than actually read the script. Um, but my brother's the opposite. So it, it, it just depends on what, how you learn. And you can get your hands nowadays with the internet. You can get your hands on so many scripts and so many things and learn so much. You can read the script for Goodfellas. You know, when I was a, when I was young, a kid, you know, you could never get your hands on a script like that unless you went to like American Film Institution or one of these big film schools that have those kind of scripts. Then you could read it and learn from it. But nowadays, I mean, people can learn so easily with the internet. It's just, it's a great thing if you want to learn. What three scripts did he send you? Uh, he, he sent me Wolf of Wall Street. I think he sent me Founders and he sent me Goodfellas. That's nice. why I brought them all up. So I think I opened Wolf of Wall Street and read the first couple pages and I was like, oh, I don't want to watch the movie. But uh, I don't know if I'll read it or not. Um, I know he's read it, but he's my writing partner. So, you know, um, I would like to read them just for fun, but I feel like now's the time to really, for me, I get more from a movie than a script because I'm a filmmaker. He's a script writer. So, you know, he's more of a script writer. He wants to just be a script writer, my brother, Charlie Ward. Um, me, I want to be a filmmaker and an actor. I don't really, I write scripts out of necessity. I don't really want to write scripts. It's like, I write them because I don't have a script, you know? And uh, I've been blessed with the fact that at least I know structure well and I get, I've watched, God, I used to watch two, three movies. I used to watch two, three movies a day when I was a kid, you know, we moved, I moved from Philadelphia when I was a kid to Roseburg, Glide, Oregon when I was 12 years old and there was nothing to do. I, would, I went from the mall and the skating rink to like, okay, there's a lot of trees around, there's nothing to do. The first neighbor is like a mile away. Well, I would just watch movies like crazy, you know, so I'd watch two, three movies a day half the time. All my free time was spent watching movies or outside running around. And uh, they, I've heard it before, you gotta watch, Ten, you got to spend 10,000 hours on your craft to really be a master at it. Well, I've easily watched, you know, over 10,000 hours of movies uh, to gotten to where I've gotten. And honestly, that's what makes you an artist in a way, because if you haven't, the things that used to shock me and impress me and um, intrigue me when I was a kid watching movies are different than what they do now, because I've seen so many of them. So it's, different you know you can think back to the time of when it did but ultimately now I have so much more of um, a library in my head of movies that now you're competing with all those as to where if I only saw seven movies this movie's amazing but it's only competing with six but if you watch 10,000 hours or whatever now I've seen Godfather and the Goodfellas and they're they're both mafia movies now they're competing against each other and so some people nowadays that and they say, oh, I, 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 this is my favorite movie, but they've never seen all these movies in the 70s and the 80s. And all. I'm thinking, well, yeah, but you don't really, you don't know your craft. I mean, you know, you haven't spent the time to watch all those movies and, and really learn your craft, you know, so. Would you say Charlie's good at one part of screenwriting and you're good at the other? Or, I mean, like, how do you work together with a partner? How is that? Um, with Seth, it was different. So Seth Himes and me wrote While I Got Wasted. Charlie is writing this new movie with me. Um, two very different writing partners for me. So Seth really wanted to put the words on the page. And so um, I would basically do the outline and then he would go off and write by himself and then come bring it back to me and then I'd read it, make all these corrections on the page and be like, the scene doesn't hit this moment. It does, I need this moment. This is like, like, as an example, this is the low of the movie. Like, these guys have to turn on each other. I need a good monologue here of him turning on him and no hope, you know? And that was one of the scenes that Seth couldn't end up doing on his own, but most of them I would give him notes and then he would go and, and make funny moments and, and do certain things and he would change it and write it. And then like the low of the movie and while he got wasted, they're on a cliffside overlooking all of Los Angeles, he could never get that scene, so I was like, okay, I'll write it. So then I wrote that scene. And the jokes in it are mine, but the jokes in the other scenes are his, and so we, it's nice to write in a group. Attachment Theory I wrote on my own, by myself. Um, but While It Got Wasted was with Seth, and then this new one's with my brother, and my brother, my brother and me have been writing scripts since, I was, scripts since I was a child. So we have very much shorthand with each other of like thinking a lot of the same things and stuff like that. Um, but 
he as well doesn't, it's funny, I have not found anybody that we like to write page, words on the page together. It's kind of like he goes off and writes, I go off and write, and then we come together. It's, I, I've yet to find somebody that likes to write in the room together. That would be interesting. It would be a dream come true in a way, it'd be fun. Um, and I've done that with my brother, but parole officers we did together. But I acted out all the characters in the living room and he sat there and would type. So I'm like living the characters and saying what they would say and then he's like writing them down. So it was a very different process with parole officers on that. Um, but most of them, uh, people want to write alone. You know, they want their creativity to, you know, quiet and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's just different. I just feel like the scale of movies back in the 70s and 80s were very different. A lot of it has to do too with the studios not wanting to take chances so much nowadays. They, back in the day, they would give, you know, a kid that did some impressive short film a, a whole budget, you know, for a movie and he would get creative and do something. But the, then they weren't so hands-on, I feel like they are now, but movies back in the 70s and 80s, they would do biopics that were three hours, three and a half hours, four hours. That doesn't exist anymore. You know, as to where, when you sat down and watched a biopic back in the day, and it was three and a half hours long, you felt like you lived a whole life, you know. As to where a biopic in an hour and 40 minutes, I'm like, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like I really got to know the character, you know. As to where in a biopic, if you see him, and a lot of it is where they start compared to where they end. And that very much interests you. It's like, maybe they start... Um, I remember Steven Spielberg talking about some movie where a, a guy starts in the beginning of the movie and he has, I think it's Lawrence of Arabia, he starts in the beginning and he has this beautiful sword and his beautiful outfit and he's so primped and proper and, and it's so clean and by the end of the movie he's so bloody and his image of the world is completely changed and he's a mess and th that's from start to finish, ideally, that's such a change in character, you know, and, and bio, biopics should be character pieces. Um, I like in our movie, um, the one I'm changing, I don't know the name of it yet, but the book's called Catch the White Tiger. He's, he starts the movie, he's selling, in Lebanon, he's selling jeans, American jeans in Lebanon. By the end, he's selling Lebanese food to Americans in America. So, I mean, like, that full circle is very interesting to me, you know. Um, and also, he's a kid in the beginning, and he's a grown adult at the end. But we're figuring out all the, the elements of that that we're going to put into it. But, but my original point was just that biopic films back in the day were such more epic. 70s movies, 80s, way more epic and had way more freedom to make a movie that was longer than your typical below two hours. And a lot of it is because I feel like today's society is so... I remember I, wa I was on a plane flight, and I was watching a woman. She was doing her homework movie was playing on, on her laptop, and she was on her phone doing social media all at the same time. <laughs> and I'm like, but don't you want to pause the movie? I was like, I, I said, excuse me, are you watching a movie right now? She says, yeah, yeah, I'm watching a movie. I said, is it the first time you've ever watched it? She said, yeah, it's the first time. First time watching a movie, and she's doing her homework and doing social media at the same time that the movie's playing. I'm like, what's the point of watching the movie? But that's what that's the kind of world we grow up in now everybody's attention span is even shorter you know so it's very interesting in that way you know people i my i think my brother told me some film students he was sitting next to and they were like i i saw the godfather i don't really see what the big point is it wasn't very good you know it's because their attention spans are so short it's sad in a way because like how are you supposed to feel a movie unless you really get into it you know um, like Silkwood, sorry to interrupt, but I, I don't know if you saw that. I remember seeing that as a kid. I don't know kid. if I have seen it. Yeah, it's pretty intense. You have all kinds of movies you just bring up that I haven't seen. <laughs> Silkwood, Who, who, what actors in it? Uh, let's see, I think, uh, is it Meryl Streep and Cher, I want to say? Sorry if it's wrong. I know someone's going to write a comment. It's definitely it's, someone I should, I, I, it sounds like a movie I'd like to watch. It, so. it's, it's intense and it's not necessarily a happy ending, but it's about a whistleblower at a company and it's um, really well hmm. done. Whistleblower at a company, have I seen it? I don't know. I'm trying I'm to rack my brain sure. at 10,000 hours if I spent my time watching it. Yeah. But I, I, I can't remember. I'll have to check it out. Mm -hmm. You know what I really love to do, actually? Uh, I used to love to do this all the time, is take an actor, I'd go on IMDb, and then I'd watch their movie history in order 
of every acting role they ever did. And nowadays it's way easier than back when I was a kid. You know, I'd have to go to the library or whatever. And luckily Netflix was around at a certain point and you could just go to their library. They had such a big library. But I loved watching how they progressed as an actor. And I like doing it for film directors too and watching from starting movie to the next movie and seeing how much they learned and how they progressed as a filmmaker as well as an actor. So. Yeah, I think I remember having to go to Blockbuster too and they had this like huge book it was almost like a dictionary and you'd have to like go through it and then try to like cross-reference stuff and yeah. That was my first job actually. <laughs> my first job was at Blockbuster. Oh, which one? <laughs> the one in Oregon? Yeah, the one in Oregon, yeah. And you'd have your top picks or whatever and so my first job was at Blockbuster and I would literally, like I loved helping people f discover new movies, you know, it was like a joy to me back then. And you used to get the movies before they came out, you know, before normal people could get them. That was thrilling for a week. And then also, you, I, I remember I could rent five movies a week, and so that was like a, 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 a one way I could, you know, watch so many movies. It was great. So, right. I always liked the movies at Blockbuster that there weren't fifty of them on the wall. It was always these obscure ones, and it was a treasure. It was it was really a challenge to try to hunt through and find them, mm -hmm. you know. So it wasn't necessarily. Yeah, that's gone now. It's it's funny. I miss that. I do too. Yeah. I still stand. It's funny because I'll stand there. Um, people that know me well, I'll stand on the remote on Netflix or whatever, and I just like to look. And I spent 30 minutes looking. And, uh, you know, people were like, well, are we ever going to watch anything? I just like to look. Uh, I miss that process at Blockbuster, just looking for movies, you know, and trying to find something new is, is very fun for me. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I miss that too. For Wally Got Wasted, how did you post casting notices? Was it on the major sites or? Before I even get into that, there was one thing I forgot to say earlier. Because oh, yeah. um, I was talking earlier about my, you know, believing in yourself and all that kind of stuff. My dad was a very much a believer in telling me I can do anything that I want to do uh, in life. And actually, he he wrote a book and he has a child's book that's for sale. It's called A Little Bedtime Journey. And I think you can go to littlebedtimejourney.com to get the book. But it's an empowering hypnotherapist book for children, actually where you like count down from 10 and it really makes them believe in themselves. And he used to actually read that book to me all the time when I was a child. Oh, so just to plug that for nice. him. Uh, and he's such as, you know, everything that I am is because of him and, and my mother, you know, for supporting me. But so I had to plug that. But um, also the casting process for while I got wasted. Um, so I ended up casting the whole movie myself. We hired, uh, we talked to more than one casting director actually, and we had these big casting directors that were gonna help cast the movie and they loved the script. They casted Blackish, the TV show, and um, a whole bunch of other TV shows they casted, and they loved the script, which was, it's always nice to hear people in the industry high up go, hey, who wrote this script that's so good, you know? Um, that was great to hear. But ultimately, their agent talked them out of doing it. So the casting director's agent, like, who are they? No, they're nobody special, you know. So we ended up losing them eventually because they had to focus on casting shows uh, and making more money than we were going to pay them. So then we ended up getting a casting director out of New York and had her go after names. Ultimately, you haven't made a feature yet, you know. Meaning me, I haven't made a feature yet. You're nobody special. So names... You got to wow them with money. We didn't have money. So they're not, they probably didn't even read the script. So I just like, oh, please read the script. You'll love it. They probably never did. So ultimately, I ended up casting the whole movie. By, uh, luckily, I've been here long enough that I asked like the producers on Orange is the New Black, the, this producer here, this director there, hey, can you suggest people? And I'd give them the breakdown. And they'd send over 10, 20 people uh, in an email, nice enough to send over 10, 20 people of who they thought would be good for the role. And I did that and I had asked acting schools and just, I mean, searched high and low and had every single person do video auditions. And so it was interesting um, because I, I, I didn't do in-person ones, I would do the video ones. And then I would, maybe they auditioned and they did decent, but they didn't do that great. Uh, or did what I want, so then I'd call them and give them, coach them on how to do it better and then let them do it again. And so that's how pretty much it took place. But Patrick, our lead, Patrick Cavanaugh, um, I saw him in a play uh, that Alex Soule, a, a common friend of ours, put on. And I saw him do a play like six, seven years before we even shot Wally. Oh, wow. And I just never forgot him. He was just very talented in the play. 
and he had a likability that I knew was very charming and it was, I thought very Michael J. Fox-ish. Now I don't know if that he's that in the film because we have him playing such a neurotic, but he has that quality, he has a very likable quality. And so I wanted him to do it, but then we were going after names and he was like, okay. And I kept telling him, please audition, do an audition tape for me. And he said he would, but he never got around to it. And then I auditioned like 30, 40 people and then eventually he did it and he nailed it. And then we didn't, you know, it was no question after his tape that this was the guy that needed to do the part. And I think Patrick did such a great job in the movie. I'm really proud of his performance. And then he's the, the, the lead of the movie and I'm his counterpart. And then the third lead is um, Aaron Groban, who plays Jerry in the movie. And he's very much the, the iconic stoner character that's not that smart and constantly doing the wrong things. You know, at one point we get, finally get rid of the body and he left his wallet in the pocket, you know what I mean? So there's like <laughs> all these kinds of things. And why'd you leave the wallet in the pocket? Oh, I don't like my wallet in my pocket. It gets all crunchy, you know, like just stupid stuff happened with him. Um, and that's very much a character that's iconic in history. I mean, Jack Black played it in Orange County and Sean play, Penn played it in, um, what's that high school movie, Ridgemont High? The or Fast, time, the Fast Times. Fast Times of Ridgemont. Crow, yeah. yeah. And so Aaron did a great job. And actually Aaron did like a commercial for Seth, my partner, uh, when he was working for a company. But Aaron acts in everything he possibly can. He's just a working actor and he doesn't care what it is. And he'll just go and he'll act. And so he had worked with him in like a, just a, not even a, like a real acting job. It was like a, talking to the camera, I believe. And uh, he's like, well, I know this guy, he might work. And he had a big beard at the time. And I mean, he did an audition tape. There was moments where I saw that it could work. And so we found him eventually too. And it was so hard to find that role. It was the hardest, probably one of the hardest roles for me to cast because people acting stoned is, um, it's just a very hard thing for people to do. Like everybody, I believe they're acting. I don't believe they're really that person. And so you gotta find that person that you believe they're not that smart or you believe that they're perma high, basically. So that was a hard thing to do, but he, he did, I think he did a great job. Some people, I find that people either love or they hate him. They're either talking about how great he did or they're like, eh, I didn't really believe that. So it's very much a love or hate role, but that's any role in history, so, so it's okay. Um, Lissa, our leading lady, that was hard to find too. Because I was trying to find somebody who had that kind of Cameron Diaz in the mask quality or dumb and dumber quality that was very much laughy and fun and never took anybody too serious. Um, and it was really hard to find uh, actresses to do that because the lines they would always read and it came off either a little bitchy or a little snobby or a little something that I just didn't like. And Lissa actually lives in Nashville. She doesn't live in LA. And somebody suggested her for the movie and then I reached out to her and I was like, hey, would you audition for the movie? She said, yeah, but I live in Nashville. You'd have to fly me out for the movie. Um, and so I was like, oh gosh, man, we don't have the budget for that. And, um, and I was like, fine, you know what, you can just read for it. You know, do make an audition tape. And I'm thinking, she'll probably bomb it and then we don't have to talk about the details later. And of course she did the audition tape and she absolutely killed it. And, uh, and then I was like, gosh, shucks, all right, well, I found, my, I found my Lucy. So we ended up flying her out to do the part and stuff. And then we had a lot, we had a lot of luck too with some amazing actors. Uh, Alex Soule, who was in uh, American History X and he's in all kinds of movies back in the day. He came out of retirement uh, for the movie and acted in the movie. He, he kicks ass in a very iconic Russian roulette scene that people seem to love. Uh, Larry Hankin came out for the movie and he's, I mean, he's an icon in my opinion and how many great movies he's done um, from Escape from Alcatraz with Cl uh, Clint Eastwood, you know. I mean, he's been around so long and he acts in so many things. I managed to get him in the movie and he, um, he did a great job. We had Sally Kirkland in the movie who won I mean, she's won a Golden Globe. She's got nominated for Academy Award. She came out and acted for us. So I was just really lucky with my cast and I'm sure I'm forgetting people that were phenomenal in the cast as well. But I was just really lucky that uh, I found the right people for the roles that we did. And I pride myself on having good actors in the movie because um, we have to discover talent, you know because we don't have enough money to get a name or somebody who's well known. So I literally had to find people that were undervalued on both sides in front of the camera and behind the camera. You have to find people that are undervalued for their skill at this moment in this time, because all the same people I probably couldn't afford to hire now 
a couple of years later because now they are getting paid more to do behind the camera work and in front of the camera work. So, Do you have an interesting uh, story about LAX? I'll get to that. Rewind real quick because if you want celebrity stories. Alex Soule's part in the movie, the, his iconic role in the Russian roulette scene, was actually written for J.K. Simmons. Oh, wow. Um, I, like I, him. I met J.K. Simmons one of the small jobs I had. I was inspecting Teslas. And, That's a good cool uh, job. Yes. And uh, the company knew it was J.K. Simmons. He just won an Academy Award at the time. And so they're like, we know you're the movie guy. And so I was like their number one person to go do this kind of stuff. And so I, I went and inspected his Tesla. And it was like I saw whiplash like two days before, three oh, days before. Cool. And I was like, man, I got I to gotta take advantage of this opportunity. I didn't know how I was going to take advantage of it. But I was like, OK, cool. I'm going to try to strike up a conversation and really try to connect with this person. Because that's the, that's, and that's a word of advice for people too. Like when you meet a celebrity or somebody that has clout, try to befriend them. Try to talk to them as a human being. Don't try to get a photo. Don't try to, even though you probably end up getting a photo, that's fine. Uh, try to connect with them as a human being as to where don't, don't start acting stupid or, or, I don't know, geek out on them too much because if you're in this field, you're going to see them again probably. And so really try to make a connection with them. So anyway, I'm going there the day of. I, I know I'm meeting J.K. Simmons. I know I'm inspecting his Tesla. I show up and I'm like, man, I, I, really, I really hope to connect with him. I show up, he's like, here's my Tesla. If you need anything, let me know. And he walks inside. I'm like, oh my God. I'm sitting there inspecting the Tesla. I can't think about my job at all. Uh, of course, he's getting flying colors on the Tesla, trading the Tesla in. But then uh, he basically came back out and um, <laughs> he came back out and I was like, he's like, are you all done? I'm like, yeah, but we need to take the car for a drive. And uh, I came up with this on the spot. We don't have to take it for a drive. We need to take a drive, and I'm not comfortable driving your car, so you should drive, I think, and I'll ride shotgun. So I got him, I got him in the car to, uh, I got him in the car to, to drive him. I was like, we drove around a little bit, and we were making small talk, and as soon as we get in the car, I'm like, I have to say I'm a little, in I wanted to make him laugh. I was like, I gotta say I'm a little intimidated. I just wa watched uh, Whiplash yesterday, and I, I just don't want you to yell at me, you know what I mean? So I, that's one of the reasons I didn't want to drive, you know? So I got him to laugh right away, which was good. And uh, we drove around a bit, and I was like, well, I'm, we, I should see what it does on the freeway, you know? Like, and I, we ended up driving around for 45 minutes, and uh, I ended up talking to him about everything, about how he started in LA, and everything that he's done, and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's very interesting to look back on it. But I befriended him. I ended up actually shooting a video with him that day because I told him it was my sister. My sister's birthday was like in a couple weeks or something. But I told him, it's my sister's birthday coming up. Is there any way we could do like a little skit um, where I'm singing her, I talk to the camera, I'm singing her happy birthday, and then you interrupt me and go, Ch -ch -ch -ch, hey, do it again. You're off key. Just like the movie because right? I just saw uh -huh. the movie. And he agreed to do it. We shot the video right there uh, in his like driveway. Uh, <laughs> That day, he thought it was cool and it was for somebody's birthday, so he was such a nice guy. And then I told him, I showed him the, at the time I didn't make Wally, I had the trailer for parole officers and I showed him the trailer for parole officers and he giggled and laughed at that. And then I was like, I'm making, a, I'm going to make my first feature, you know, is there any chance he might be able to, you know, stay in touch and maybe there's a role in it, maybe there's not. And he said, yeah, that'd be fun, you know, uh, stay in touch, you know, and I already had a cell phone number because of the gig. And so we wrote the role in the movie for J.K. Simmons. That role was written for J.K. Simmons, and then J.K. Simmons was too busy to do it. He was off in Europe doing a movie or whatever. And, um, and so we ended up having to find somebody to do that movie, and that's how we found Alex Soule, um, mm -hmm. who was a friend of Ronald Quigley. Uh, and Ronald Quigley, who plays Skaggs in the movie, suggested Alex Soule. I didn't know Alex Soule was even an option. I thought he was retired, but apparently... He sent him the script, and once he read that part, he was in love with it, and he was like, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do. I'll follow the paperwork. I'll follow the file, the paperwork with SAG to get out and come back and, and do the movie. So he ended up doing it. So, yeah. Cool. And, yeah, it, on, on a plane flight, um, actually, I sat next to Jimmy Schmitz. And um, at the time, I was very young. I didn't know what to do next. You know, I just moved to LA. I quit working for Todd Phillips and, and, and DreamWorks. I knew I wanted to act, but I really had no idea how to get started. You know, I had no idea how to get started with acting. 
And so I asked Jimmy Schmitz what to do, and Jimmy Schmitz um, said you should go to this acting teacher and take acting classes. And so I went and, uh, and I started acting school after that, after meeting Jimmy Schmitz on a plane and stuff. There's a lot of good ways for people to get educated out there on how to make it as an actor. There's a book called Cracking the Acting Code written by Taja V. Simpson that's a really great book that goes over, I mean, and she has been in the industry so long, she literally explains everything you need to do from start to finish, like, and so educational. And it's funny because um, when I first started out in, in acting in, in LA, people would charge you for consultations, like $100 for an hour, you know? And you sit down and they tell you what you need to do and whatever, and nowadays you just need to go buy a book like Cracking the Acting Code, and it breaks it all down for you and you can read it over and over again if you want. But when I was, and I'm sure there was books then too, you know what I mean? But people, it's funny because our industry, so many people are making money on the underbelly of it, on acting classes and books and all these kinds of things. And so there's so much knowledge out there in a good way, but there's also so much knowledge out there in a bad way that you don't know what, what is the good information and what's the bad information. And so that's one of the reasons why I say that book, because it, it has um, a lot of value to it if you're just starting out. Or, or I think it has chapters where even when you're you know, at a higher level, maybe you need to break through and you, you need more knowledge in that way as well. So. No, that's important because I think so many books are geared toward people just starting out, but what yeah. about people that are actually having continuous success yeah. and then who do you ask for help because I'm sure there's so many so many agendas and, and yeah. things people tell you. Yeah, it, it's so interesting to me because like I didn't know what a guest star was compared to a um, co, uh, I don't even, can't even think of the names now, co-star role compared to a guest star role. You know, I didn't know what was the difference between a co-star role and a guest star role, you know what I mean? These are the kind of the things that you learn in the book and you should know what the, what all those things are. You know, you should know what you're going out for and what sacrifices, you know, I learned like once you're going in for co-stars and you decide to go to guest stars, you don't go back to audition for co-stars. So like there's certain things like I had no idea and I auditioned all the time. But when you, you know, you read somebody like Taja V. Simpson's, she's gone all the way up the levels to learn all those kinds of things so you can get all that knowledge and that you just, you don't know. No, not a lot of people want to help you when you get to those levels. Yeah, when, it's funny because in the beginning, everyone is willing to help you and, and try to help you to get to where you need to be. And a lot of the people helping actually have never been there. I found that every acting teacher I ever had had like a co-star role in a TV show one time or something, you know, and they're selling it to the, to the ends of the wheel. So the people at the top of the ladder, it's very rare that they share their knowledge, you know. Um, especially on the business side of acting. I mean, the acting side, a lot of people will share. But the Cracking the Acting Code goes over everything, you know, which is, is a great book. You can get it at crackingtheactingcode.com. Uh, cracking you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at, locally here at Samuel French, the bookstore, uh, and, and Barnes and & Nobles, I think, as well. So you, it's a lot of places you can find that. I'm sure if you just Google it, you get it on the website or at Amazon easily. Um, but it's rare that somebody shares their knowledge when they're up there at the top and about the business side of acting, which is very interesting, as well as the craft. So um, I find that with everything, too. It, it, it's funny how that, that is. It, it's, it, artists and people, they feel very lucky to be where they are. And a lot of people that are naturally gifted, they're terrified that they have a secret and they don't want to tell everyone the secret or that everybody can do what they do. They don't realize they're naturally so talented. So they usually don't want to share with other people or help people get to where they are because usually there's a self-worth there that they don't feel secure enough to help other people. So You talked about like sharing knowledge and, and wanting to be generous and I think that's great and I think there are people that want to help. I think the part that gets weird is some of the takers. There's so many people that want like, you tell me how to do it so I can just, just um, jump start up here and I don't have to go through and pay my dues mm -hmm. so I think sometimes people are wary of that and that's very understandable mm -hmm. because there is that element here and yeah. I hate to you know throw a bucket of cold water on it but I think that's speaking yeah. truthfully yeah and so I think that might be sometimes why people pull back because they're like okay is this person they want my help but do they really want my are they really going to do what I tell them would help them or they are hoping I'm going to pull them up with me and all the time I spent 
now I'm expecting that they're just going to circumvent all that and come with, you know. I, I, I totally understand that. I think it's funny because a lot of people don't want to pay their dues. We're in a world of instant gratification when it comes to social media, when it comes to everything, it's instant gratification. And the truth is, if you want to be an actor, if you want to be a film director, it's a career and it takes time. And I've seen the only people that I know that are successful in the levels of like what they wanted to do, they put 15 years in working hard. I mean, Taja V. Simpson, who wrote that book, she's, she's been working as an actress 15 years, you know, and, and she's finally now getting, you know, all the things she wanted to get, and it takes that much time. My, my sister, um, she's a big musician, ZZ Ward, she, you know, she's on her third album, but her goal is to win a Grammy, you know what I mean? So it's like, uh, it takes so much time to learn and to, um, to get there, and so, yeah, people, you get shortcuts by learning from other people, absolutely, if you can learn from other people. I think ego is a problem, is the way is, ego gets in the way, it's your greatest strength and it's your greatest weakness in this town. You need to have everything I was talking about as like a, a strong shell when people doubt you, but you can't have the ego to think that you're not learning. You know what I'm saying? So if you have this strength and belief in yourself, that is great. But the moment you think you don't need people or you don't need to learn something, that ego is your worst enemy because you need to continue to learn and continue to get better. And that's the belief you need to have is that you're going to get there and that you're going to learn how to get there. Not that you're the, the diamond that when you walk into town that you're just so shiny that everyone's going to love you because that doesn't exist. Um, you might be really good at acting in your small town in Nebraska, and that now you're here around people that look just like you and they're just as talented and have more experience. So you better get the experience, and the only way for you to get that is to believe in yourself and to keep working hard to get it. So, And that's why I worked so hard on making Wally Got Wasted, and I hope everyone enjoys watching it on Amazon and rents and buys it, and please leave us a review. We really need reviews on Amazon. It really helps the movie. And you can also reach out to me if you want um, on social media, um, Adam William Ward on Instagram. And I try, to, I try to respond to all the messages that people give to me. I don't always get a chance. So if I don't, I apologize. But um, if it's reasonable, I try to say thank you. Or, or if people have questions, answer them back. With the movie, sometimes I get a lot. Sometimes, you know, some days I get none. So. I'll do my best, Adam William Ward on Instagram. So if people want to friend me, there you go. <laughs>